thank you all for attending the Manhattan Institute's conference on affirmative action, uh, meritocracy, and the future of higher education. My name is Jason Riley. I'm a senior fellow at the Manhattan Institute, uh, where I do a fair amount of, of public speaking. Uh, and a couple months ago, I was invited to participate in a debate on affirmative action in the Supreme Court's pending decision. And the invitation said it wanted me to come offer my unique perspective on affirmative action. Hmm. Uh, I accepted the, the invitation, but I began my remarks pointing <coughs> out that my skepticism of these policies is anything but unique. Uh, maybe unique among members of the mainstream media. It might be unique uh, among uh, most cable news hosts. Uh, may be unique among academics and other intellectual elites. But my skepticism of affirmative action as it's practiced today is well within the mainstream of everyday Americans. And it has been for decades. Uh, racial preference policies began in earnest in the 1970s. And they've never been popular, not with blacks, not with any other group. In a Gallup poll taken back in 1977, a majority of black respondents expressed opposition to special treatment. In a 1997 poll that asked how equally qualified college applicants should be treated by admissions officials, 69% of all respondents and 63% of blacks said, quote, race should not be a factor. A 2001 Washington Post poll asked this question. In order to give minorities more opportunity, do you believe race or ethnicity should be a factor when deciding who is hired, promoted, or admitted to college? Or that hiring promotions and college admissions should be based strictly on merit and qualifications other than race and ethnicity, unquote. 92% of all respondents and 85% of blacks said such decisions, quote, should be based strictly on merit and qualifications other than race and ethnicity. In more recent years, the story has been the same. A Pew Research Center poll in 2019 found that 73% of respondents, including 78% of whites, 65% of Hispanics, 62% of blacks, and 58% of Asians said, quote, colleges should not consider race in admissions, unquote. So for more than four decades, ordinary Americans have been telling pollsters they don't support racial preferences. Occasionally, you'll come across a poll that finds different results, but those polls are outliers and usually reflect artful wording of the question or not defining affirmative action in any detail. For example, a 2013 survey by the New York Times found that 53% of respondents favored affirmative action. But the story quickly added that, quote, other surveys that frame the question in terms of giving minorities preferences find less support. In other words, the more accurately you describe affirmative action as it is practiced today, the worse it polls. This morning, we have three thought-provoking discussions lined up for you uh, that will offer more supposedly unique perspectives on affirmative <laughs> action. Um, and I'm very grateful to be joined by my colleagues from the Manhattan Institute and others who come from various legal and academic backgrounds. Jim Copeland, to my immediate left, is a senior fellow at the Manhattan Institute and director of legal policy. Uh, Jim will lead the first panel uh, discussion on the legal merits of affirmative action, how the Supreme Court might rule in these cases, and what the effects will be on colleges and universities. Uh, Mene Ukaburua, who I'm also glad is here. There you are, Mene. How are you? Um, will lead the second panel on the history of the impact of affirmative action and racial classifications with a focus on the impact felt by Asian American students. And finally, I will have the honor of interviewing Linda Chavez, chairman of the Center for Equal Opportunity. Uh, Linda is a longstanding leader in the fight against discriminatory policies and quotas across government, higher education, as well as the private sector. 
And with that, I will turn things over to Jim. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jason. Uh, it's an honor to, to, to share a program with you. Jason's a, a dear friend and, and uh, just a leader on, on thinking, I think, clearly on all these issues. As are our, our panelists here uh, this morning, we were originally going to have Peter Kirsten, a longtime Civil Rights Commissioner. He came ill late yesterday. Uh, so I, I will probably be speaking more as moderator than I normally would. Normally, I would ask open-ended questions uh, here. Uh, you know, the sort of conservative lawyer view is going to be one I'm going to be uh, uh, responsible for articulating a little more because our, our panelists have, have, have slightly different backgrounds that I think they're going to bring to the table. Um, to my immediate left uh, is Richard Banks. Professor Banks is the Jackson Eli Reynolds Professor of Law at Stanford University. Uh, <coughs> also authored a book on College and the American Dream and what's gone wrong. And so I, I think has been thinking about these issues a long time and, and it's going to give us a lot of interesting insights. And then to his left, uh, at least on the podium, uh, is Anthony Bradley, Professor of Religious Studies and Director of the Center for the Study of Human Flourishing at the King's College here in New York, and, and can, you know, is going to be able to speak to us uh, more holistically you know, from a Christian college perspective and, and some of the ethical issues that we're thinking about here, et cetera. So I want to just frame this up a little bit uh, at the beginning. What we're talking about here is, of course, uh, discrimination on the basis of race, using race as a factor in admissions in higher education. And the two cases uh, brought by students for fair admission against Harvard and UNC are going to be heard in tandem, although <laughs> not decided in tandem at the US Supreme Court. Uh, they'll be decided separately. One, of course, of those is a private university, Harvard. The other, uh, which is uh, Professor Banks' law school alma mater, um, one of which is a public university, the University of North Carolina, which is my undergraduate alma mater. Uh, and um, so they, they're going to be heard separately, not necessarily for that reason. They were originally consolidated, but because our newest justice, Justice Brown Jackson, uh, is, has to recuse herself from the Harvard case being a, a fellow of, of Harvard College. So, uh, so we're going to have eight justices hearing the Harvard case. We'll have nine hearing the UNC case. Uh, the, the sort of legal history here uh, since affirmative action grew up in the 70s, and Professor Banks can shed mm. more depth on, on, on how that emerged over time. Uh, the, the, the seminal case that came out in 1978 uh, was Regents v. Bakke, the case out of California, looking at these uh, very questions in the, in the University of California system. And what you had there was really a split court. So you had a group of justices which said, nope, this sort of race discrimination, it's remedial, it's, it's fine, it's fine to discriminate against white people on behalf of black people in college admissions. You had another group of justices that said, nope, our, our constitution is, is race blind, this is race discrimination, strict scrutiny, classic analysis, you can't do it. And then you had Justice Lewis Powell in the middle. And so he, Justice Powell articulated uh, the, the diversity rationale, which is now the rationale everyone talks about. It's not necessarily the only rationale for affirmative action. It may not be the best rationale for affirmative action, but it's the legal rationale uh, because he was in the middle. He tipped the majority of the court in, in, in favor of countenancing uh, uh, what California was doing, or at least in part countenancing what they were doing, depending on how you do it. No strict racial quotas, et cetera, but it can be a tipping factor in admissions, and you, race can be used in that way is the way he articulated it. And, and that became sort of the standard that then guided the lower courts. Now, when I was a young student in law school, uh, you came out with the next sort of case out of the Fifth Circuit, Hopwood v. Texas. And the Fifth Circuit basically front ran the Supreme Court and ruled against affirmative action and said you can't use race as a factor in admissions. This is 1996. Um, and uh, notwithstanding what, what Powell had written, they were sort of reading the tea leaves of other cases coming out of the Supreme Court, running up to that. Uh, but uh, if they projected where the Supreme Court was going, they were wrong, uh, at least when the Supreme Court got the question in 2003. In a companion case, is Gratz v. Bollinger and Grutter v. Bollinger coming out of the University of Michigan. Uh, one of those cases, the Gratz case, overturned the undergraduate admissions uh, policies at uh, the University of Michigan, which actually gave numerical rankings to student applicants and gave a higher ranking for black applicants than for white applicants, among, among other uh, differentiation. And they said, no, you can't do that. That's just overt race discrimination. It's not just a tipping factor. It's not a holistic review. But they allowed what the law school was doing in Grutter v. Bollinger, uh, which was a more holistic process 
predicated upon critical mass of students. Um, the dissents, uh, Chief Justice dissent in particular sort of unpacked that, and we can talk about a little bit how they unpacked it, although it's not necessarily germane to this case, and, and, and said, well, no, I mean, they, they clearly are Im implicitly using quotas, they're just not quite as explicit about it. But the majority of the court said what, what can happen, you know, what, 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 what Michigan's doing at the law school is okay, uh, it, it passed muster, and it, for the first time, put a majority of the court behind this diversity rationale, although famously Justice O'Connor uh, said, well, but we don't think this is going to need to survive beyond 25 more years, which is five years from now, uh, so we're not quite at, at 2028 yet. That was in 2003, and Justice Thomas sort of uh, 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 smirked at that or, or sort of uh, a little bit sarcastically in a footnote uh, joined by Justice Scalia in his, in his dissent said, I concur with the, the majority's opinion that this will be unconstitutional in 25 years. <coughs> then, then we had the Fisher cases coming out of Texas. Texas of course switched, Texas of course had to switch its policy after 96 when Hopwood came out uh, because it, that was the Fifth Circuit which included Texas. And then uh, after the Bollinger cases came out, Texas went back to using a more holistic review process. In the interim, Texas had put in a system where the top 10% got auto-admitted uh, into the university as a way to sort of come up with a race-blind system. The university admissions officers, for various reasons, weren't uh, thrilled with the way that was uh, working. And so after they got a green light from the Supreme Court in 2003, they came back and started using race as a factor in admissions. It came up to the Supreme Court twice. First in 2013, the court punted it back down and said, you didn't apply the right strict scrutiny standard that we said you had to in Bollinger. Uh, it came back up three years later. Uh, at, by this point, the court you know, Justice Scalia passed away after our argument before decision. Um, and so you had a, Justice Kagan was now on the court but had to recuse from these cases because she'd been involved uh, as a member of the Obama administration as Solicitor General. So uh, you had a four to three decision at that point which affirmed what Texas was doing. And we can talk about uh, the particulars there. And then now we've got this newest case, again with new, a newly constituted Supreme Court uh, which, which is coming up against Harvard and UNC. This is the first case uh, that involves a private university. Mm -hmm. And so the private university, as well as the public universities, because they get federal funding, fall under Title VI of the Civil Rights Act of 1964, which says you cannot discriminate on the basis of race. Um, UNC also falls under the 14th Amendment, the Equal Protection Clause, which applies to state governments, UNC being an organ of the state government. And that's the way these cases have more traditionally been analyzed. Now, now Historically, the tests for these two have sort of been mushed together. That may or may not be the case after this case is resolved in June. So I'm going to turn it over to our learned Professor Banks, who's, who's thought about these issues a lot more than I do. I'm a basically a law and econ guy. Uh, can, 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 can fill us in if, if I've gotten any of this wrong and talk about uh, his view on the history of this in the broader context of the history of affirmative action more generally in higher education? Okay, thank you very much, and you can call me Rick. It's a pleasure to be here with you all. I'll try to be very brief because I think you all and us want to hear, have more discussion and exchange rather than have us talking at you. So uh, everything you said was, of course, uh, correct. This is a momentous decision. Uh, the, my short take on it is that it's almost certain that the Supreme Court will rule in favor of the plaintiffs in each of these cases. Just to be clear, I don't, I don't think there's a lot of uncertainty around that. Right? And the case against North Carolina will rest on the Equal Protection Clause, and the case against the, uh, Harvard will rest on the federal statute, which the court has interpreted to apply the same prohibitions as the Equal Protection Clause. So it's likely the universities will lose, and then the question is, well, how far will the court go? Right? How far will the court go? Um, will the court issue what we'd call a narrow ruling on one hand or a very broad ruling on the other, right? The narrow ruling in this case could apply uh, very, uh, you know, could be limited to the specific claim <coughs> that the plaintiffs put forth. The plaintiff's claim is that the universities are capping the numbers of Asian American applicants, right? And that's flatly illegal. If the universities were to admit that, uh, that's flatly illegal. Uh, to cap the number of the, of the group on the basis of, of their race. Uh, and the court could prohibit the universities from doing that. And it could just stop there, 
But what the plaintiffs want in their case is not simply that the university prohibit uh, that sort of capping uh, of their numbers. What the plaintiffs want is that the universities be prohibited from considering race at all in the admissions process. So they want a mandate that the admissions process be colorblind. And, and that's a much broader ruling, obviously. And then if the court goes there, the question is, well, what does that exactly mean for the for a university to admit students in a, quote, colorblind fashion, right? I mean, it seems intuitive, but one of the themes, I think, of this whole discussion is that it is full of contradictions and complications and paradoxes, uh, as Jason has highlighted at the very outset, right? So if the court mandates colorblindness, what if the university says, okay, uh, I'm not gonna consider anyone's race, uh, but I'm gonna consider <coughs> whether they've been subject to racial discrimination in society and whether they can write an essay that talks about their being subject to racial discrimination in society, or whether their parents have been subject to racial discrimination, which we think is a bad thing and we prohibit. Uh, is that a violation of a colorblindness norm? Or what if they were to go a step further and say, you know, anyone whose uh, ancestors were burdened by slavery and were enslaved in the United States and have you know, reasonable evidence of that, uh, you know, we're gonna take account of that in the admissions process. Is that a violation of colorblindness? What if they say people who live in areas that were burdened by slavery or segregation, irrespective of the individual's race, but just based on the location that they're coming from? Is that a violation of colorblindness? So those are all questions about how far the court goes. And one way to think about this is that the, the divide between taking account of race and being blind to race, it's not a bright line. Right? It's not a fact about the world. It's really just filled with fuzz, right? It's, it's fuzzy in the same way when I take off my glasses, all of you are fuzzy, right? So that's a fuzzy line, and the only way we can <coughs> draw distinctions there is to have some sort of principle uh, that helps us to determine uh, what's permissible and what's not. So I'll stop there for now and look forward to engaging further. Sounds good, and I, while I think we may differ a little on, on you know, some of our normative analysis, I agree completely uh, with, with Rick on his positive analysis of what's gonna happen at the court. And I don't know which way they're gonna go, if they're gonna go narrow or broad, but I do think Harvard and UNC are gonna lose, and then the question is, is how they lose. Yeah. Let, me, let me give you, before I talk, let me give you one more, if you wanna make it a little bit more provocative here, because I want us to have disagreement. Uh, I do think affirmative action is unfair but so is any admission scheme which would replace it. So now, if, that's, if you don't think that's provocative enough, get another, get another cup of coffee, right? <laughs> but, but that's really the, the issue here, is that we've created a system that is inevitably unfair to someone on some basis, yet we've labored under the illusion that we can remove the unfairness. When in fact, the situation we're in is one of choosing among different types of unfairness, which is why this is a hard case, right? And one that's really uh, sort of uh, salient in the culture, because it's one where we're gonna prove that we can't resolve the matter in a way that everyone agrees is fair. I passed the baton. That's a good segue to Professor Bradley. You know, I'm used to talking about what's efficient He's used to talking about what's <laughs> fair and what's ethical and what's right. So how does that shed light on the way you think about these questions in your experience? Yeah, thanks so much for having me here. I think one of, one of the <coughs> really important issues is how we define fairness. Yes. Uh, losing is not necessarily evidence of unfairness. Uh, not being qualified for something is also not evidence of, of, of unfairness. One of the awesome things about America is the differentiation we have in terms of opportunity. So if you don't qualify on metric A, you may qualify on metric B, C, and D, and there are lots of opportunities that way. This idea that fairness means that, that there, there, there must be admittance on this one lane only uh, is, is part of the problem. So for me, I, I sort of think about it this way. The, the, the ends, or rather the question is, do the ends justify the means? And what do we want? I mean, we want uh, 
a higher education space that is multi-ethnic and diverse. That is fantastic. The question is, how do we get there? How do, how do we create that? Mm -hmm. and, and adjusting on the outcome side of, of the ledger is, is the wrong way because it actually hurts the people and intends to help. We really want to have a robust dis discussion about affirmative action in terms of higher education. We need to focus on K to 12 because that's really the, the, the theater that produces the, the disparity. What is it that allows some students to have <coughs> extremely high academic marks, fantastic uh, preparedness for, for higher education, and what are those variables that undermine and sabotage those things? That, to me, is part of, of the discussion of fairness. And what's unfair, if you want to use that, that language, uh, is, that, is that we have, we have introduced a context where it's almost as if, well, it doesn't matter if, even though the data is really clear on this, uh, students that come from two-parent households outperform mm -hmm. those who don't, right? Uh, students who come from uh, 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 communities that have cultural values of delayed gratification, that matters a lot, right? So what we do is we sort of ignore some of the predictive variables uh, for this, mm -hmm. this sake of, of socially constructing the outcome that we want without really focusing on the very things that, that could produce the outcome in a context of, of, of open and equal opportunity and participation with, with the level of differentiation that we have uh, out there. Now, as a professor, I've seen this work really poorly against students that it intends to help. I'll just give a, a, quick, a quick story. I've been teaching uh, students at both the high school level, the graduate level, and the college level now for about, about 20 years. And I know you're like, but you look so young. I know, I know. <laughs> but I, I have, I've been doing that. And I had, a, I had a one, one student who came into the King's College. Great. I mean, this guy's uh, personal attributes were fantastic. He was polite, well-spoken. But he, he graduated from an absolutely horrible high school in Chicago public high school, his math skills were, were terrible, his writing skills were terrible, but he was just a really great person. His personality got him really far. He was at King's, he was struggling, he was getting C's and D's, because our, our curriculum is a classical education, pretty rigorous. He was struggling, so I told him to leave. I said, you need to get out of here and go somewhere else. Right? And everyone was like, why'd you tell him to leave? You know? What about retention numbers? I don't care about retention numbers, I care about his success. What I told him is, you need to leave and go to a less competitive school so you can catch up. So you can sort of build the skills that you didn't get because this public school in Chicago did you wrong, really. And what happened? He went, he went over to New Jersey, and I'm not slagging on, on New Jersey, by the way. Uh, but he went to a, a public college over in New Jersey, and his skills caught up. He graduated from this college with a, a, a 3.45 GPA. His self-confidence was really high. Had he, stayed at, he, had he stayed at King's, graduated with a 2.0, his self-confidence would have been really low. But he graduated from this other school, self-confidence really, really high, got brought into a leadership training program with AT&T, and soared. Right? Now, in an affirmative action context, it, the pressure would have been on us to keep him for the sake of our diversity numbers, and we would not have done him a service. So, I, I, and, and so whenever I meet students who are struggling, who are minority students, I tell them, just go to a less competitive school, get your skills up, because your self-confidence and your, your skill set matters way more to me uh, than our diversity numbers. And I, I, think, I think in terms of fairness, or rather justice is fairness, uh, it would have been unfair to him to keep him in, a, in, a, in, a, in, in, in an academic context uh, that wasn't one that he could have succeeded in. And every time I see him on LinkedIn, he's got promoted several times. Uh, I'm just, I'm just celebrate because it's, it's just really great to see him finally catch up uh, to where a lot of his peers were when he, when he uh, came in. So for me, the ends don't always satisfy the means. We need to really focus on, on the variables that make those contributions to, to academic success. And they tend to be on the front end, not the back end. And that, to me, is a problem.
Yeah, this is what in the literature is often called the mismatch problem, uh, sort of coined by Richard Sander, a professor of law at UCLA, who's done empirical work on it. There's been a, a lot of empirical work. It's not all come down the same way, but, but at a basic level, you know, this is what we see. And it could, you know, the problem is here, though, it can be experientially difficult to see for those of us, you know, I mean, Rick and I, went to Harvard and Yale Law School, he teaches at Stanford Law School. You don't see the same, you don't see that type of mismatch at those law mm -hmm. schools because, you know, and, and, and Justice Scalia, when he brought this up in the oral argument, Fisher mangled it a little bit and, you know, led people to believe he was saying that, no, you know, no black students can do well. No, 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 no one's saying that. But there, there could be a disparate impact in terms of, if you look at the population averages that the schools are getting and, uh, you know, what students there can do, uh, coming out of high school or coming out of college for law school, you, could, you can see significant gaps. If you started looking at, at things like the SAT or L, LSAT numbers, you'd see significant gaps in the per percentages of the students based on various demographic categories, black, white, Hispanic, other, Asian. Uh, there'll be different gaps depending on, on, your, on your group. And um, so the, the, these most selective schools, the Harvards, mm. Yale, Stanfords, you know, can get student bodies that, that look about the same in terms of you know what their, their students are, are able to do there. But you know it, it may be the case that they're, they're rejecting 80% of white kids and 90% of Asian kids uh, that, that could also look like mm -hmm. that student body um, and, and rejecting a small, much smaller percentage of black kids so that by the time you get to Michigan Law School, uh, which was what we, we saw the data for in Grutter v. Bollinger. You get more than a standard deviation gap uh, between the black students and the white students in terms of their LSAT ranges in Michigan. And Michigan is a top 10 law school, right? And you'll see it very pronounced fashion. Um, uh, and you see this over and over again, uh, you know, just anecdotally. I mean, my wife, who's black, was a graduate of, of Horace Mann here in New York and uh, went to, to, to Johns Hopkins, you know, back at the time, and they, they don't do this now, but back at the time, you know, they wanted to make sure that, you know, their big check writing, you know, students, full pay students were the ones that were getting the, the Harvard, Yale, Princeton slots. So my wife, Tahira, her friend, Aaliyah, you know, they were saying, oh, you should go to Johns Hopkins, you should go to Brown. It's the only place she applied, right? But she shows up at Johns Hopkins, and Johns Hopkins did it differently than the way <laughs> we did it at Chapel Hill. Chapel Hill, and, and that may not be the case, depending on how this case comes down going forward, but there was a separate summer orientation program for black students, et cetera. Johns Hopkins didn't do that. They had a remedial program that had academic components in the summer to try to catch students up um, that disproportionately went to black students, you know, my wife wasn't involved in that program. She wasn't mismatched. She shows up and sits with the black kids in the cafeteria, you know, f first day of the school. Say, like, who are you? Where were you this summer? You know, okay, well, no, I, I wasn't here. You know, she tried to get into this program. They wouldn't let her in it. So, so, you know, a strange sort of phenomenon. But, 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 my wife was also the only person in her class to graduate with honors. It's hard to to have a remedial program in a summer and make up for these gaps going in and saying. And that's Johns Hopkins again, an elite selective university. As you go down further. Uh, it becomes trickier and trickier. And when my wife was teaching at the community college locally, part of what she was trying to do was uh, do exactly what Professor Bradley's talking about and say, you know, maybe you should go be a truck driver. Maybe you're equipped for this work and try to tell people where they can go depending on their gaps. Or, you know, the community college exists for precisely that reason, if, if, if a student's not cutting it at this school or that school. But what the mismatch literature showed, and Sandra first did it with law schools, like, oh, well, you look at the bar passage rates. Uh, coming out of law school, and uh, for black students or, or, or any students who are mismatched, in other words, their academic raw data, their LSAT GPA numbers don't look like the other students, the bar passage rates are significantly lower uh, than for non-mismatched students, including non-mismatched black students, because almost all these schools will have some black students that are not mismatched for a variety of reasons. Um, and uh, so, this is the question. The intended beneficiaries here not, aren't necessarily being helped. I mean, I, I'm on uh, the board of a historically black college university uh, state school in North Carolina. Um, and, uh, you know, the numbers are always such that you know, we always say, oh, the HBCUs do great. Like half of the black doctors and scientists, that's an approximation, uh, come out of HBCUs. Well, there's lots of hypotheses to explain that, but one is mismatch, right? So that, you know, a student who is mismatched 
due to affirmative action, you know, again, not at these <coughs> top of these schools, but, but, but at the vast swath of, of, of education in America, is going to show up and, and get weeded out of the, the pre-med classes or the, the math engineering prep types of classes so that even if that's what they want to do, they end up saying, okay, well, I'm going to go to this other course of study so I can graduate and get my degree. And it actually affects students in, in a pronounced way. So how do you view this, uh, Professor Banks? It's not necessarily where this legal case is going to turn here, particularly if they focus on the Asian American uh, point narrowly, but, but, but how do you view mismatch? Yeah, this is the great issue. So the, um, uh, the term mismatch is, a, is I think, it's a little unfortunate, right, because it kind of slants the, the analysis. The general question is, how do we think about situations where you have a student, say, to keep it simple, a student who's put in an environment where the other students are higher achieving, right? And that's kind of the situation that mismatch describes. And one possibility there, right, as we've heard, is that the student who's a you know, lower achieving student among the higher achieving students will become discouraged, their self-confidence will suffer, they presumably won't learn as much, they'll kind of withdraw, um, and they will be harmed in the long term if that's what happens, right? But that's not the only, and that's a legitimate concern, obviously, right? And, and, and that's, a, that's a, I mean, that's really important to know that if that's primarily what happens. But there's another possibility here. It could also be the case that the student who's lower achieving among the higher achieving students, that they actually gain some benefits from being in that group of higher achieving students. They might decide, you know, maybe I should study more. My roommate has really good study habits. Uh, maybe I should set aside some time to study. Uh, maybe in talking with their roommate or their classmate, they hear some ideas that they might not have heard if they were in a group of lower achieving students. Maybe that inspires them, maybe that promotes them, right? And so we can imagine then that when there's a disparity between the you know, achievement of the group as a whole and the achievement of the individual, just to keep it simple, that it could depress the achievement of the lower achieving students, but it could also elevate it. And you know, that's something that uh, we, we, you know, there's evidence to support that view as well. Right? So when you look at uh, black students, for example, um, they do tend to do better in terms of job market outcomes and in terms of likelihood of graduating, say, when they go to schools where the students are actually higher achieving than when they go to schools that are lower achieving. Right? And so just to, you know, from Michigan to, to Harvard, say, right? Or from, you know, just take your, take your pick, right? So, that evidence sort of supports the positive effects of there being this discrepancy between achievement uh, of, of different groups of students. Um, the HBCU uh, example is, is sometimes used to show what happens when there isn't mismatch, right? And everything is geared uh, toward the students sort of where they are. Uh, and it could support that, but you know, there are a lot of other things that are different about HBCUs, uh, and, and I say this as a person, so I've taught at Stanford, uh, I have children at Stanford, uh, I also had a son who went to Morehouse College for his freshman year, uh, and Morehouse College is really different than Stanford in a lot of ways. Uh, it's not only the um, composition of the students in terms of their achievement level, it's different almost in every imaginable way. So uh, the HBCUs do an extraordinary job by some respects, right? There's some issues there too, but whatever their success, I don't know that we can attribute that to lack of mismatch as opposed to some of the other features of the environment that make them especially hospitable for the students they serve. Professor Bradley, thoughts? Right, and, and I think that word environment is, is really, really important. You know, what's, what's, what's fascinating about, about the American story, particularly with, with the HBCUs, when I was in high school, I, I'm, I'm a Gen Xer. My parents were sort of <coughs> raised, raised uh, during, during Jim Crow, sort of the first generation post Jim Crow to go to sort of do it in an open society, uh, so to speak. And for my parents' generation, born in the late 30s, early 40s, the track was this. You go to an HBCU, and then you go to Harvard and Yale for mm -hmm, grad school. Mm -hmm. So you go to Hampton first, you go to mm -hmm, Howard mm -hmm. first, and then you go to Harvard. And so Hampton and Howard and Morehouse and Spelman, those were feeder schools into those because, because of mm -hmm. the environment. There was, it's a community of, of, of support and training on how to survive in, in this sort of American landscape. 
And that's another added benefit in terms of sort of how to play the game, right? And, and sometimes, sometimes when, when minority students are thrown into theaters where other students have all these soft skills in terms of how to survive these environments, they don't have them. Uh, they can learn them, you're, mm -hmm. you're, you're, you're correct there, but they also can uh, lose out on, on some opportunities mm -hmm. for success. A great example of this was at uh, UC Berkeley. Uh, there was a, a math professor who noticed that uh, uh, his, uh, the black students were not, not performing that well in, in his math class. And, and he said, listen, uh, they all got in. I know they're smart, but for some reason, the, the black students are, are underperforming compared to some of the Chinese students. And what he noticed is that the black students studied by themselves. And the, Asian, the, the Chinese students studied in groups. So what they basically did is they got the black students to study in groups, and guess what happened? The performance disparity disappeared. And so those are the, those are the, the types of things mm -hmm. that even in a high-achieving environment can, can be overcome. I think, I think it's, it's also true that we want to, uh, well, a couple things. One, uh, it's not true that if you don't go to a top 10 law school or top 10 college, your life will be terrible. Right? That you would have a really great life, and I'm not slagging on any school in New Jersey, but if you go to Rutgers Law School, you can have a great career and great life. It doesn't mean you're going to miss out on having a fantastic life. Right? You could go to Waka Waka Community State College somewhere in the middle of Iowa and have a fantastic life. This idea that you can only have a good life a great life, a, a successful life by going to these five or six schools is, is part of the problem. It, 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 sort of, it sort of feeds into this FOMO idea that if I don't, if, if I don't go there, uh, my, my life will be uh, terrible. And, and I think, I think we, 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 we do a disservice to the entire edu the sort of higher education landscape to really not provide people opportunities to see that they can be successful in, at any school, at, at, at any major uh, in, in any program, but they have to hustle and work hard. And that you can, <laughs> you can graduate from Notre Dame and end up on the Supreme Court, right? Uh, as opposed to only having to go from, to Harvard and, 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 and Yale. So hard work, perseverance, those sorts of things to me really, really matter. And, and, and often those are missing in, in, in the equation. And this, this obsession that, that the only way to have a good life is, is sort of uh, narrowed here. Another thing is that we shouldn't assume that HBCUs are less rigorous in terms of mm -hmm. their education yeah. and that the students are lower performers. That's not always the case, right? If you look mm -hmm. at, if you look at, there's a range, of course, yeah. right? But I would, I would uh, uh, offer that schools like Morehouse, Belmont, mm -hmm. Ham uh, Howard, Hampton are just as rigorous mm -hmm. as, as Brown and, and, and Cornell. Probably more. Uh, pro 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 probably more. <laughs> and, and, and in fact, in fact, I, I teach at a, a small Christian uh, college. I think we're probably more rigorous than a lot of the uh, Ivies because we, we have a sort of an inferiority complex, right? So we're, we're going to prove mm -hmm. uh, that we're mm -hmm. just as, as competitive as everyone else. So we're going to work mm -hmm. our students more than everybody else. Mm -hmm. so if you look mm -hmm. at our syllabi versus the ones we're getting mm -hmm. at Princeton, my students do way more reading. Uh, and, and writing and essays than, than their friends at other schools. In fact, I, uh, when I was doing my, my PhD program we, at, a, at a seminary, we had a student who left my seminary, a, a, a Protestant evangelical seminary, to go to Princeton because it was easier, because <laughs> uh, my school was, was way, way more uh, uh, rigorous. So I, I, think, I think if we can, we can introduce and take the pressure off uh, uh, students that you could have a really great life have a great career by going to the, the myriad of, of schools that we have, it would take some of this, some of this pressure off. And, and I, I, I tell my students all the time, it, just do, it doesn't really matter where you go, it really matters what you do with it. And, and we need to go ahead and, and feed people, because you can go to a great school and have mm -hmm. a terrible life and end up indicted and go to prison, because mm -hmm. uh, you're a terrible person. Or you can, have a, you can be a morally upstanding person, go to a non-competitive school and have a great career and end up being fantastic. Yeah, let me, I'm completely uh, in accord with the spirit of your comments, which, which I love. Um, but I do think that there is a, um, we should recognize that the, the mania, the obsession, the fixation 
with elite colleges in particular reflects the fact that we do have a society, and it's become more so, in which we pick winners, education, and, and, uh, you know, uh, socially, culturally, economically. We pick winners very early, and we put enormous, and it, there is enormous consequence to this decision of where you're in school. So you can have a, a great life wherever you go to school. Uh, but will you, do you have any hope of being on the Supreme Court if you don't go to one of a handful of schools? No. Do you have any hope of working for a justice on the Supreme Court if you don't go to any of a handful of schools? No. Do you have any hope of being employed by any of a number of elite professional services firms if you don't go to a very small number of schools? No. Because those firms only interview at a small number of schools. So that's why the obsession with these institutions is, from the parent's point of view, perfectly rational. Because they realize that the you know, Notre Dame graduate who makes it to the Supreme Court, <laughs> like, OK, that's the exception that proves the rule. And the rule is that we have accorded more weight to educational credentials in American life than ever, not only in our history, than in the history of the world, frankly in the history of the world. And that's why there's such cutthroat competition. Right? The other point I want to raise, which um, uh, it kind of fits in here, is that the, um, you know, we've talked about the harms for, for black students or you know, under, students from uh, underrepresented groups. But what I see a lot and in, in, in increasingly concerned about are the harms for, for all students of this ruinous competition. Um, so schools won't tell you, and they don't want to tell you, um, but the mental health challenges on campuses, at the more elite campuses, have risen dramatically, uh, even preceding COVID. Uh, and that's re re reflected in, in everything from eating disorders and depression to suicides, suicide, yep. suicide attempts. Yep. Uh, really, it's a ruinous situation. And that's because we've created a situation where people feel, with, with reason, with reason, <laughs> that how their life is going to turn out is dependent on decisions and performance and getting the gold star when you're 17. And if you don't get it when you're 17, uh, you're going to be on a different track. Uh, and the sad and tragic part of it is that to some extent that is true. Which yeah, is, I mean, one second, which is, which is all the more reason for me to tell, I'd say parents, if your child doesn't, doesn't end up on the Supreme Court, it's fine. Yes. Right? If, they, if they don't end up working for one of the top firms in America, it's fine. Because yes. if, you, if you look at the mental health uh, uh, challenges emerging from people on the track, is it worth it? Yes. I mean, is it really worth it that your child ends up in a rehab program bec yes. because they had a cocaine addiction at Columbia trying to perform mm -hmm. uh, so they can get uh, a Goldman Sachs internship? Is it worth it? Right? Like, what's really worth it? So. So how we define success, I think, mm -hmm. really matters in this discussion, sort of morally mm -hmm. and, 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 and ethically. And we can set people free, I think, in these discussions mm -hmm. by, by broadening out how we think about success and just allowing them mm -hmm. to have fantastic lives and to make contributions to the common good. You can make your community a lot better. Mm -hmm. You can make contributions to making the world a better place. You can make your communities and families and societies really, really better by sometimes doing things in the middle. It doesn't mm -hmm. have to always be at the top. And, and yeah, I, I think morally everything there is correct. I do think there's a skew here in the discussion, and it's because you get elite people making these arguments. There are elite people at the Supreme Court. There are elite people in the professoriate. There are elite mm -hmm. people at the think tanks. There are elite people, uh, uh, you know, arguing these cases, et cetera. Um, and we're obsessed over things like Supreme Court. I mean, that's nine people, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. What I'm sort of worried about here is. The, the vast, I'm worried not about the, which schools are going to be Supreme Court feeders, but what's going to happen to the black kids that are at East Carolina University or Virginia Commonwealth University or schools like this um, if they're broadly mismatched. And that's, that affects a hugely higher number of people. And I think the empirical evidence here, while there are alternative hypotheses, um, I, I think the empirical evidence here is pretty strong um, that, that you know, students are on average, on net, done a disservice we were talking about not these tippy top elite institutions, but but yeah, from the perspective of the elite institutions, like yeah, okay, we want to open our doors, we want to have access. I get that. Let's 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 shift the focus a little bit 
back towards the case and the potential outcomes here. And let's assume that the court goes broad. Um, and the, the court says no race discrimination in admissions. In other words, the regime we get is something akin to what California got mm -hmm. after it put, put the ballot up, uh, the referendum uh, on the ballot in California, or what uh, the Fifth Circuit got after Hopwood. Um, how do we see these universities responding? Because they are going to have uh, resistance here. There will be resistance. You know, it, it, it won't be George Wallace going to the schoolhouse uh, gates or what have you, but, it, but it's going to be a, a massive resistance uh, to this on the part of the universities if the Supreme Court were to come down this way. Um, and you may even see things like grandfather clauses, which we, we saw hypothesized mm. here by, by, by Rick as, 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 as a possible end around. So, you know, my kids, oh, yeah, well, they're, I think half of their great great mm -hmm. great grandparents mm -hmm. were all slaves. Okay, so they're going to get a massive preference over. Um, you know, a kid who's got a, a, a white single mom living in a trailer, right? I mean, that, that's literally what, what, what we're talking about here. Um, that'll be harder to do uh, if the Supreme Court goes back <coughs> here, but how are the court going to react, right? I mean, one thing we've already seen is this sort of SAT optional, but how are they going to react to this? Well, I, I think it just as it seems clear that the Supreme Court will likely rule against universities, it also seems clear that the universities will not give up their quest to enroll a quote di diverse class of students. Uh, and they have uh, a lot of different options that will, will likely still be available or that they may at least want to, to explore. Uh, let, me just, let me just mention two, perhaps. So you know, one option is that they will consider factors that are associated with race but are not identical to race. Right? So what if a university says, look, uh, we're going to give some preference to students from schools that have not been uh, well represented within our student body? So if you come from a school where no one from your school has gone to our university in the you know, last five years, you get a bump. If you come from a school where someone from your school did attend our university you know, last year, the year before, then you don't get that bump. Uh, that's clearly going to have a race-related, class-related impact. Um, and they might do that partly for racial reasons. Um, will that be prohibited or not? Right? That's, gonna, that's a tough question um, about whether the court even would prohibit that. So that'll be one option. Another option, which has not been discussed very much, is that a lot of the selective universities now increasingly rely on middlemen, so to speak, uh, to get their students. In other words, you have college access programs that strike deals where they kind of go out and find students on one hand, then they strike a deal with the university and says, look, um, you know, you join our consortium and we'll send you some students. Uh, and we'll send you two students a year, 10 students a year, 50 students a year, every single year from around the country. And the university could just say, okay, we're gonna have 10 slots a year for this school, I mean, for this program. We're 50 slots a year for this program, 50 <laughs> slots a year for this other program. But it could be that those programs themselves are extremely race conscious when they go out and try to find students. Yeah. But the university's not being race conscious. They're just saying, we're going to give 50 slots to program A and 50 slots to program B. Is that going to be unconstitutional? You know, maybe, maybe not, right? But so that's the sort of thing, I th that's the sort of thing universities are already doing, in fact. Right, is they're relying on these programs. So I think that could become more salient and a, a larger uh, 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 a proportion of the students could be admitted through that sort of trap. So those are just two possibilities among many. Thoughts? They will figure this out, right? Because for, for, for many of them, sort of, you know, diversity is a bit of a, a religion. Mm -hmm. So they're going to make it happen. There are lots of ways that you can figure out where people are from by race, mm -hmm. right? If I was a state school, let's see what I would do. If I was a state school, I would just preference zip codes. Yep. That's, that's all I would do. Yep. We, we, here's a list of zip codes in our state. We're going to preference these zip codes versus other zip codes because how we live in America right now, mm -hmm. we, we live according to income, property tax, and zip codes. Mm -hmm. So you have low-income zip codes, high-income zip codes, and if I, want to, if I wanted to... To, to increase the, the enrollment mm -hmm. and, and, and offer a preference for black students, <coughs> low-income black students, I would just choose a certain uh, number of zip codes. There's so many ways around race in terms of it being explicit that you can get to it implicitly. I, 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 think, I think university admissions will sort of 
give this a bit of a shoulder shrug uh, because there are lots of ways. And, and this, this may be less the case. You can just look at some people's names. Right, and, and make some, some conjectures about that. I mean, that, that could be um, mm -hmm. one way around it. And, and, so, and some of these programs, like, like you mentioned, I mean, they, they do, they say, hey, we will, we will get the students and then send them to you. Now, here's what's interesting, though, right? Uh, so you, what, what you'll also have sometimes is the, the extremely successful high-income minority parent, right? Mom's a lawyer, dad's a doctor. They put their black kid in the same program, and that mm -hmm. kid gets into Stanford, but the, the, the low-income stu student from a single parent who actually needs the program <laughs> doesn't get access because the, the doctor lawyer's kid is in the program, right? And so it's, it's interesting. I think, I think th this is one of those instances mm -hmm. where we often conflate race and class. Mm -hmm. And I think what we really want is, is, is diversity based on class, and we often, I think, get that confused with, with race. That's, I think, for, for me at least, yeah. that's the real sort of diversity that I, I think really serves the country, is class diversity rather than racial diversity, because racial diversity uh, uh, doesn't always um, uh, represent need, right? I mean, I, I come from a pretty, uh, extremely successful family. Uh, of, of, my, of my sibling uh, group, my, my sister is the only one that doesn't have a doctorate degree, <laughs> uh, lots, lots of family members at, at Columbia. These sorts of programs for us really wouldn't benefit mm -hmm. us as much because our, 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 our family is extremely successful. But some of the low-income families that I work with in Harlem, they need those programs mm -hmm. in order to give them sort of expanded opportunity. And I, 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 wonder, I wonder if we could maybe, not in this discussion, but may, maybe our discussion about affirmative action ought to be more about class uh, rather than race as a way to have, um, I, I, think, I think, a more, a more broad uh, discussion about opportunity. Because if you're, in, if you're from a low-income community in Appalachia, your, 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 your worldview is pretty, pretty limited. Mm -hmm. and, and how can we expand this, this, this the imagination for what's possible for students who are coming from low-income communities, whether it be a housing project mm -hmm. in a low-income community or a trailer park uh, somewhere in a... Yeah. Some kind of community I mean, like that. Yeah, but, but Let me, can, I, I, can I just provide some context? Yeah, we do want to get audience questions yeah. in, but keep it brief. Yeah, no, I, I think that's a fabulous one. These are great points. Just to give the sense of the demographic changes behind <laughs> uh, some of this controversy. Uh, in 1978, at the time when Baki was decided, that's the University of California case, um, you know, their affirmative action program was, quote, for disadvantaged students. Uh, and, it, and that kind of fit with race, because at that point, uh, most black students, for example, they were like really disadvantaged, right? They grew up in a segregated America when the schools were starkly unequal. Um, so there was an identity almost between race and disadvantage. This is kind of what he's highlighting, but over time, that identity has loosened fairly considerably, right? And now what you see at many major universities is that, it, and this is just the reality of it, is that the black students who are admitted, and it's true with Latinos as well, they're not the children of the you know, poor people that, as would have been the case, uh, you know, 50 years earlier. Yeah. Um, they're actually the children of, you know, educated professionals. Increasingly, they're also the children of immigrants. Um, the percentage of black people who are from non-immigrants, right, recent, who were, whose ancestors have been here for many years, that's becoming vanishingly small. Uh, at the most elite universities, uh, and that too is a reflection of the fact that this disadvantaged group that we initially brought affirmative action in existence for, they're a smaller and smaller proportion of the students who actually end up on the campuses. Which is in part, I think, a function of affirmative action programs and the fixation on race as opposed to class. I mean, it's a little dated, but they did a study, Harvard looked at it a few years ago, two thirds of their black students had either a white parent, like my kids, or were the children of, of immigrants, right? I mean, so this was, but, but again, if the diversity thing is what you're looking at and race, whatever that means, and Professor Bernstein in the next panel is gonna tell us that we don't know exactly what it means. Uh, you know, that, that's, uh, you know, it's increasingly, difficult, I think, to do. When it comes back to this litigation, and we're going to open up to questions now, so yes. raise your hands, but when it comes back to this litigation, I mean, I think the important thing to keep in mind is, is that intentional race discrimination is still going to be 
discrimination. So if the court comes down with a, a non-discriminatory principle and then it comes out in discovery with emails, oh, we're using this as a proxy for race, they're going to lose in the next round of litigation. You know, we've, th this is what happened with the Thomas Jefferson High School's shift towards holistic admissions. It's, it's not resolved yet. We've got an amicus brief in the case in the Fourth Circuit uh, on this point that they were clearly doing this uh, as a proxy for race. And, um, you know, the, other, the same thing could be true depending on uh, how the universities are doing it. If they drop SATs, but in fact they're only dropping SATs for non-whites or non-Asians, uh, that's going to come out in discovery. It's going to be pretty easy to identify, and depending on what the legal rule is there, you're going to have a second wave of litigation. I think that wave's inevitable because I do think the universities are going to continue to fight back and fight back hard. Do we have an audience question? Raise your hand. Up here. Wait, wait for the mic so that everyone can hear. Thank you. Um, wondering about the degree to which the Supreme Court will be deciding along purely legal constitutional lines versus some uh, vision or point of view on what fairness means and what that is for the country. And to that end, when we're talking about the nuances of this and um, the legal parameters start to break down, are they trying to, will they be trying to, or who will be trying to think about what is the, the future philosophy of the country versus the current um, uh, like public will for these large, mm -hmm. complicated, vague issues like fairness? Oh, you want me to take that? Yeah, oh, yeah. well, I, 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 don't, I don't know that there's, so the question is, is, is there, I, I don't know that there's a lot of daylight, frankly, between the, the sort of analysis of what is fairness versus what, quote, the law should be. Right, because the problem here is that the, the Equal Protection Clause, which is the, the reference point here, it doesn't say anything about colorblindness. It doesn't say anything about discrimination, actually. Uh, so the legal materials, both the text of the Constitution as well as the prior cases, Brown v. Board of Education, for example, they're pretty open, and they could be consistent with widely divergent interpretations. So, uh, yes, this does require uh, a lot of judgment about what counts as fair. Uh, it requires judgment about how to interpret uh, public uh, appetite, sensibility, public values. It requires judgment about how to assess the harms and benefits of various policies. Uh, it requires a vision of what sort of society we want to create and how we're going to get there. Um, so I think there's just no way around that fact. Yeah, I'm going to agree in part but disagree in a significant part on this too. None of the opinions that come out of the court on either side of this case are going to broadly invoke questions of fairness over the law, qua law. I mean, that is how they're all going to be written. Now, are there embedded norms in the way the justices read the law, view the law, think about the law? Of course. Um, I also do agree with Rick that you know the, the open-ended equal protection clause of the 14th Amendment is is broad. When I first saw this case coming down, particularly with Harvard included, I thought, well, you know, they're going to avoid the constitutional question mm -hmm. and go to mm -hmm. Title VI on federal funding, mm -hmm. which allows Congress to come back and re-legislate re if they want to, um, and say, uh, although given the poll data Jason articulated at the outset, you know whether that's going to be doable, but I think a strong Democratic majority in both houses and the president could probably do it. They'd need 60 votes in the Senate. Um, but, but, you know, they, they could come back. But because on the basis of race is not too ambiguous, right? On the basis of race is pretty clear. And, and this is, in fact, exactly how the Supreme Court came down on sexual orientation and gender identity in the Bostock case written by Justice Gorsuch. And Justice Gorsuch was pushing that line of analysis in the oral argument in this case although it didn't seem like any other justice was following along, so I'm not sure they're gonna go there and, and decide it that way, but he was pushing that. I think he wants to write it that way under the statute, um, and he got the Solicitor General of the United States essentially to argue in front of the court that on the basis of sex in the context of Title VII under Bostock meant something different than on the basis of race in the Title, title VI meant of the same statute in this case, which is a pretty untenable position the Solicitor General is trying to uphold. So, I mean, but, but I don't know that they're going to go just on the statutory basis. Uh, you know, they have conflated the statute and the 14th Amendment historically, as the professor said. But I, you know, but th th they don't necessarily have to be coterminous, and they could avoid the constitutional question if they went on the statute, but 
I, I'm not sure a majority of the court's going to go that way. Yeah, I don't, I don't think this court is prone to avoiding issues. Yeah. There. So. <laughs> Actually, go to Ken first. One over here too. Yeah. Uh, it, it seems to me the mismatch pro problem is a, a great problem if you look at where we're headed. Uh, how do the universities deal with the mismatch problem, uh, and do they acknowledge it, and do they have programs beyond remedial, or do they just say, okay, we made our statistics, we've got a diverse class and let the chips fall where they may. I think the, the further along you get in the process, the harder it is to, to, to fix it. But you know, I mean, you know, earlier grades, it's easier to fix it probably, right? Yeah, so now there's an entire, yeah. uh, there's a, a, an entire industry called student success. Mm -hmm. And if you, if you sort of look at the proliferation of, of university staff, there's a student success team uh, uh, more schools are having deans and assistant deans of student success and their job, their entire job, or they might even have an, an entire department just devoted to the first year experience. And their job, their, their entire job is to make sure that those students make it to year two. And so the, the entire student success area is really devoted to that. Now, what's interesting is that if you're a small liberal arts college, you don't have the money for that. If you're a big state school, right, you can ask your state legislator to give you more money for student success, and then you can introduce all sorts of interesting advantages for student success for the state, right? You can appeal that way. And so student success has emerged as a, as a way to, to address that. So it's not really sink or swim at these sort of big state schools. The, 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 the tension point are the small liberal arts colleges that may not have the resources to have a massive student success team. And it's not just necessarily remedial work, but it, it's sort of, it's a combination of coaching. I mean, it's student, it's, it's study skills, it's trying to help them get connected mm -hmm. with internships. All the sorts of things that, that a lot of students have just because of the context from which they come, uh, they create structures for that at, at the university. But it, it's, it's increased the staff cost, mm -hmm. right, which is increased mm -hmm. tuition cost which increase the amounts of loans, which increases the need for scholarships for the same programs. And that, you know, there, there are other ways that we could achieve those ends. And if it sounds a lot like participation trophies, I think it's kind of because it is, right? I mean, when my daddy started as a freshman at UNC, the chancellor spoke to the class and look to your left, look to your right. One of you is not gonna be here next year, right? Um, now colleges are evaluated on graduation rates and outcomes, which makes sense from a certain point of view. Uh, but, but basically, if you wonder why, why this, the, the entrance exams and the admissions and the tests are so high stakes now, it's because everyone gets out. Mm -hmm. So getting in is, is the variable that's mm -hmm. really so relevant to a lot of these students. I'm going to take here mm -hmm. and back there. Uh, I'm going to take both questions and then we'll try to, to answer them a little bit and wrap up. Um, uh, good morning and thank you for being here. Uh, it's been really great. And uh, what I'm wondering is, that in my discussions with peers, mainly lawyers, mainly from elite schools, and also listening to uh, the liberal justices in the Supreme Court and a lot of advocates of affirmative action, seems like the real reason why people support affirmative action is that they believe it's a form of, of uh, restorative justice mm -hmm. for historical racism or what, you know, Ibram X. Kendi would call systemic racism mm -hmm. and, you know, the current anti-racism movement that this racism is so fundamental. It's still going on even if nobody's mm -hmm. still a racist. Mm -hmm. And do you think that that attitude, that theory, can actually justify racial preferences today uh, legally it, or morally? I wrap it up because we, we, we want to keep sure. going. I'm sorry. We got it. So systemic racism, restorative justice, not diversity. Diversity is just a fig leaf that Lewis Powell came up with as, as the one justice in Baki. Yes, back yes, here. Yes, uh, thank you so much for the great discussion. My question is, do you think um, anything will happen to the practice of legacy admissions mm. on the heels of these uh, decisions once they come out? I have two children in New York City private school and there's one variable that is the best predictor of where they're gonna go to college. Mm -hmm. It's not grades, it's not extracurricular activities, and it's not race, it's legacy status. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I actually question empirically if that's correct because we've actually had evidence come out in Harvard that shows uh, you know, once you control for other 
uh, factors that, that the, le the legacy students tend to be better on, but, but it is clearly a strong predictor, and it's clearly got a disparate impact that's, that's racially loaded. So the rationale, diversity rationale versus restorative justice and uh, you know, legacies, whence legacies? These are, these are both great questions. So on the, on the, the, one of the ironies of affirmative action is that Justice Powell and Bakke essentially made diversity the sole rationale that universities relied on for affirmative action. But it's always been the case that universities and, and many other people who support affirmative action would say, no, we're really doing this to repair the past, right? And it really is restorative justice. And there's always been that disjunction between the two. Uh, the problem, of course, is that uh, you know, affirmative action, I think most people would see, is, is not uh, an effective or sufficient uh, response right, to the history of uh, slavery and Jim Crow and you know, racial discrimination. So, uh, and, and it's unlikely that this, that this court, just to be clear, would be uh, very sympathetic to the uh, affirmative action as uh, restorative justice approach. On the legacy admissions, uh, it has always, so legacy admissions is a process where the uh, children of people who attended the school, they get a bump up in the process, just as if they were racial minority. Um, you know, that there are, at least on paper, more students who come in through that route than who come in through the conventional affirmative action route. Uh, you might see the legacy admissions practice as being colorblind because it doesn't take account of race, but it was actually instituted for really color conscious reasons. Um, when schools, including some here in New York City, decided that they wanted to limit the number of, of Jewish students that they had, and so they began to uh, give a preference uh, to so-called legacies as a way of privileging uh, and, and you know, boosting the numbers of the traditional white students they had who, who, who weren't Jewish. So there is a racial origin even to legacy admissions. But lastly, one of the ironies of legacy admissions now is that many of the uh, alumni groups of color have become supporters of <laughs> legacy <laughs> admissions, right? Because you, know, you have at Stanford, for example, you do have, you have black alums who say, oh, you're gonna stop legacy admissions just when we can take advantage of it, right? And so the supporters of legacy admissions now, that's a pretty diverse group, right? Another irony of the process. Uh, it's not, I would, I would be surprised if the Supreme Court though were to prohibit uh, legacy admissions. Um, no. So. But, 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 the, but the schools may react. One thing I don't think they'll do is uh, get rid of super high donor potential admissions, right? I think they're not gonna do that. Any other final thoughts? Yeah, really, really quick. Um, so so I, I understand and I, I sympathize with this, this sort of restorative justice comp, uh, uh, framework and, and the idea that we wanna diversify these elite spaces, absolutely. The question is, is there a better way? And, and the, the evidence just shows over the last three or four decades that affirmative action just does not work. The <coughs> people that it intends to help, it doesn't help. Uh, white women have been their primary um, beneficiaries of it. I'm always going to advocate if we really want to diversify the education space in higher education, mm. we've got to do a better job of pre-K to 12. I mean, that's mm. really where it matters. And we, and we just can't ignore that and, and want universities to sort of uh, fix and, and account for that. On the legacy question, just follow Georgia Tech. They've eliminated legacy admissions, right? So they're doing it, they're doing it right now. And they have some really angry alumni mm -hmm. in Georgia Tech. And they're like, listen, we don't care, right? Now, it, what's, interesting, what's interesting is that, yes, they have some, some angry alumni donors, but they also have uh, some corporate donors as well. So they've just sort of shifted where they get their money from. Like, hey, uh, John can be mad, but uh, Google isn't, <laughs> right? Because Google's gonna get great employees from us. And so Georgia Tech has done away with, with legacy admissions. They've also done it away with automatically giving admissions bumps to professors' kids as well. You're going too so, far now. So yeah, yeah. That's, that's too far. That's, that's exactly. a bridge too far now. So there are professors at Georgia Tech whose own kids cannot get into Georgia Tech uh, as well. So if you want a model of where that might go, I would pay attention to Georgia Tech. And, and you look at, you know, public universities, UNC Chapel Hill, where I went, I mean, and this may not be universal, but they, they've long, even when I was there, they didn't have legacy admissions for in-state kids, right? Mm -hmm. Because everyone's a taxpayer. For out-of-state kids, they did. It's part <coughs> of the fundraising apparatus. Yep, yep. But they may think about retooling this rule, and do you really, they, they, you know, those out-of-state parents, are you that, is it that essential to your fundraising to give them the legacy bump? 
you know, I, I could certainly see those things getting on the chopping block. So thank you for everyone. We want to keep it going because we've got another fantastic panel coming up. I think Professor Bradley's absolutely right. Uh, starting earlier is the real thing. So in a future uh, conference, Jason's going to have school choice and competitive mm -hmm. schools and charter schools and all these other things and ways to try to fix education uh, before you get to the university mm -hmm. level. Uh, mm -hmm. Read Professor Banks' book. It's, it's, it's not out yet. I'm still working on it. Okay. It'll be out. When it comes out, read his book. I, I, I'm, as someone who's written a book in the policy space, we want readers. So, so uh, really uh, appreciate our panelists here and the very thoughtful and engaging questions. So thanks, Jason. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, everyone, for attending this second panel for today's uh, conference on affirmative action. Uh, I wanted to begin by placing this event in a broader history um, of conservative institutions reckoning with affirmative actions past and future. Uh, I had the pleasure of moderating a panel at a conference that Jason Riley helped to co-organize in Dallas last year. Um, and it was broadly on the racial achievement gap. We had discussions on education. Uh, we had discussions on policing and crime. We had discussions on economic opportunity. And Justice Clarence Thomas was the keynote speaker at this conference. And not only did he deliver his own speech, but he attended every single panel. Um, and when I began introducing my topic about affirmative action, I mentioned that the Students for Fair Admissions case was pending. And as soon as those words came out of my mouth, Clarence Thomas got up out of his seat and left the room. Uh, so my panel ended up being the only one that he wasn't able to watch, much to my chagrin. Um, but I thought that that reflected well uh, on his uh, you know, ethical bona fides. Uh, but the reason why this topic, of course, has become such disgust and so timely is because that decision is now pending. In the first panel, we heard a lot about the legal history and the legal merits of affirmative action. In this panel, we're going to focus a little bit more on the effect that it's had on college campuses, the effect that it's had in race relations in this country, uh, and I have three distinguished scholars here uh, who all have addressed that question in their research from a variety of different angles. Uh, so here I have Renu Mukherjee, who is the Paulson Policy Analyst at the Manhattan Institute. David Bernstein, who is a university professor at the Scalia School of Law at George Mason and Wen Fa, who's a senior attorney at the Pacific Legal Foundation. I wanted to start with you, David, uh, because you've written a lot about the origins of racial classification. We kind of take these categories for granted today, uh, that we have five or six you know, hard specific categories that people are grouped into, not just at universities, but also uh, you know, by the government in a variety of different contexts. I wonder if you could, could back up and, and describe to us what was the origin of that system and what have some of the unintended consequences of it been? Uh, so of course there was some haphazard but important racial classification going on throughout American history from the first census where they had a category of Negro and white. Although for most of American history when census takers, it was not like today where you fill out the form, a census taker would just go to your house and knock on your door and whatever they thought you looked like uh, is what they put down. So it was very informal in that sense. And there was the Asian uh, controversy over who gets to immigrate into the United States and become citizens because we had laws excluding Asians. But beyond that, the federal government in particular uh, didn't do much in the way of racial classification until the 1950s was really the origin of the modern system. In the 1950s, uh, President Eisenhower signed a couple of executive orders banning government contractors from discriminating based on race uh, and national origin and so forth. And the contractors had to fill out an affidavit saying we don't discriminate. And then it occurred to some people in the Eisenhower administration, well, they signed this, but how do we know? So from now on, we want to also want to ask them, how many minority employees do you have? And the question is, well, which minorities count? Everyone knew that black people were people that would be counted. They were right there up front, but early forums sometimes had Jews, sometimes had Catholics, sometimes had other local minorities. Uh, but civil rights groups objected to anyone who wasn't a racial minority being included. But I think even more important, in those days also, there was no self-identification. That was considered at best rude to ask someone their race or ethnicity or religion, and at worst, inherently discriminatory, and it was illegal in, most, in, in some northern states. So wait, basically, if you are what the equivalent of an HR person was today, you'd look around the room, 
and say, oh, this guy looks black, this guy looks black, but he didn't know who was Jewish or Catholic or uh, Italian that way, so eventually the only groups that were included were black, uh, Asian, which was, or Chinese, Japanese, usually back in the day, uh, Mexican or Puerto Rican, which were limited because of the way it was done, the people who looked like they were of mixed race, uh, indigenous or black, and uh, other, and you know, were, were uh, seemed to be of Spanish-speaking heritage. So that's the way things kind of stood until the early 1970s. By the early 1970s, we were getting all sorts of data at the federal government level about civil rights enforcement, about education, about voting rights, and it was noticed that there was no consistent definition of which groups uh, were included and how one should define them. And this was a particular problem for people of Spanish-speaking origin who were included, but um, Mexican-American groups became quite cognizant of the fact that different federal agencies were using different cl criteria for who they were counting. So some only used Mexican-Americans, some used Mexican-Americans and Puerto Ricans, some added Cuban-Americans, some added others, some used Hispanos as the category, some used Latinos, some used Spanish language household, some used Spanish surname. I think I counted 13 different ways the group was counted. So Casper Weinberger, who was uh, then Secretary of uh, health, education, and welfare. So we need to normalize these classifications so that we're comparing apples to apples when we get data from different agencies. And in the most ridiculous and haphazard way possible, they set up an interagency commission to define which groups would count, how they be defined, uh, and so forth. Uh, to give you an example of how haphazard it was, how do we get the phrase Hispanic to describe people from Spanish-speaking countries by origin? Because uh, no one used it in the early 70s. And the answer is that they basically asked for three volunteers uh, from the government. They wanted one Puerto Rican-American, one Cuban-American, and one Mexican-American to represent the three major Spanish uh, origin groups in the United States. They sat together in a conference room and decided. They didn't consult ethnologists, geneticists, sociologists, linguists. They just, and there was one woman who was the Puerto Rican American on the panel and she just was very insistent that it be Hispanic and it go back to Spain. So the definition wound up being anyone of Spanish origin or culture, whereas it could have, for example, been Latino, which would have excluded Spain but included Brazil. It could have been uh, indigenous mestido uh, category, mixed race or fully uh, Indian, so it would have been a racial category. Instead it was the only ethnic category because it includes whites. And of course, one reason included Cuban Americans to begin with is that Nixon was very insistent on that because affirmative action was in its infancy. And he said, wait a second, you're gonna give Puerto Ricans and Mexican Americans affirmative action, but not Cubans? Cubans vote for us and they don't. Uh, so that's how, so I want you to include Cuban Americans who are an overwhelmingly Caucasian uh, and white identified group. You really have no excuse for not including anybody else. So those are the groups that we were left with. We wound up with Native Americans, Asian Americans, and Pacific Islanders. The Pacific Islanders have since been split off into uh, a separate group with, with Hawaiian Americans. Uh, Native Hawaiians, uh, African Americans, whites, uh, and I miss one, and Asian Americans. Uh, no, I said Asian Americans. So if we have the, we have the five, we have five and now six groups, and those groups, um, at first, when affirmative action was starting, different colleges had different policies. Uh, the first case to get them before the Supreme Court, the Funis case, which the court decided uh, to not hear eventually, uh, involved a guy who is a descendant of Sephardic Jews. I talked to his, gran his granddaughter recently, who told me he's, that his, uh, his grandparents spoke Ladino, the, Jew the Spanish-based language of Sephardic Jews. Today, he would be eligible for affirmative action, but at the time, he wasn't included in the state program, so he was actually the plaintiff. So eventually, all the different criteria that universities used wound up uh, being um, sub sublimated into these five and later six federal categories. Uh, and um, even though in Bakke, Justice Powell said, you know, you really have to figure out, well, what, you, know, you want diversity, you want educational diversity of all sorts, all sorts of ethnicities. To my knowledge, no college in the United States ever sat down and said, what do we really mean by diversity? Which group should count for it? Why is Hispanic ethnicity important, but no other ethnicities? They just eventually all went with the flow and said, look, if we just go with what the federal government's already doing, it makes it easier to defend ourselves in litigation uh, and in the public, and we'll just do that. So that's how we wound up with the affirmative action categories we have. Yeah, I'm glad you focused your answer there on the arbitrariness of some of those categories. Not only are they a recent invention, but there was never really an 
sort of well-articulated rationale between where the boundaries are drawn among the different groups. That kind of gets me to my second question, which is for Wen. Um, Wen, again, is an attorney with the Pacific Legal Foundation in California, uh, and they've filed an amicus brief on the Students for Fair Admissions case. Part of the argument uh, that you guys made against the Grutter um, opinion uh, is that it's impracticable. Not only is it sort of wrong as a matter of justice, but also it is impossible to actually implement in a way that is fair. I wonder if you could get into some of the details of why uh, the existing precedents on affirmative action have been so impracticable and, and talk about that from a, a legal perspective. Yeah, absolutely. Um, to begin, I want to say that, you know, uh, we did file an amicus brief in the Student for Fair Admissions cases. We're also uh, litigating cases dealing with specialized schools in New York and Thomas Jefferson. So I just wanted to give that disclaimer right off the bat. Uh, in the Harvard and UNC cases, you know, to be clear that we think that racial preferences, racial discrimination is wrong, regardless of whether it's workable or not workable. You heard a little bit about the Gratz case earlier this morning. I think that system is totally easy to administer, but it's still flatly racial discrimination, and it's still flatly, in my view, morally wrong and patently illegal. Um, but the Grutter decision, I think the court really went sort of, had this weird sort of compromise in the Grutter and Gratz decisions where they say, well, you can't just give 20 points to underrepresented minorities in Gratz, but in Grutter, they upheld the University of Michigan Law School's policy of saying, well, you can use race as a factor as long as it's holistic and you don't really tell us how you're using race. And I think that's pretty unworkable for a few reasons. One, this whole notion that we have to use race to further the purported educational benefits of diversity. I have questions about the empirical uh, justification behind that in the first instance. But even, even if were, were that not the case, I think it's very sort of wishy-washy, loosey-goosey about how much uh, like, what are the educational benefits of diversity? How much racial preferences a school can use? You know, the Supreme Court has said, rightfully so, that racial quotas are patently unconstitutional, but yet universities are still allowed to work towards some sort of unknown critical mass of students from each arbitrary racial group. So it's, it's, uh, it's on the record. Uh, quotas are unconstitutional, but off the record, we're still using um, these racial preferences to, in effect, get to these quotas. And, and, and I think that another way in which Grutter is unworkable is because this was touched on in the earlier discussion. You have schools striving towards the purported educational benefits of diversity. At the same time, you have a lot of these and I think we're seeing them more and more now, segregated dorm rooms, segregated orientations, uh, specific things where students are separated out on the basis of race. How, how is a school supposed to further the purported educational benefits of diversity in that way? And I think that kind of goes back to my original and main point, and that's that racial discrimination um, is wrong, and it's wrong for many reasons, but one core reason I think it's wrong is because it really undercuts this notion that we're all individuals. It treats us as part of, as David mentioned, uh, arbitrary, broad racial groups. You see this in uh, guidebooks like the Princeton Review uh, telling Asian American applicants to schools like Harvard, don't be a doctor, don't say you want to be a doctor, don't major in math and sciences, don't, don't say anything in your college application that makes you look like the traditional Asian Joe blogs, as they say it. And I think that's wrong. I think regardless of what your race is or what you, know, what you put on a common app checkbox, you should be free to pursue your individual dreams based on your own goals, your own skills, your own aspirations. And I think that's the America that we strive for at Pacific Legal, an America that treats every individual as an individual. Yeah, I think that's a great point. And if you read uh, Justice O'Connor's rationale, uh, there clearly was this sense that we can allow these tweaks, uh, this, you know, putting a thumb on the scale 
without fundamentally changing the college admissions process or without being fundamentally unfair to any specific group. But all these years later, it's very clear that that precedent has completely changed the experience of applying to college and attending college for Asian Americans uh, who are most directly hurt uh, by the racial balancing. I wonder if you could get into what the response among Asians has been historically, whether it's changing, uh, what we can learn from poll numbers specifically, um, if you could just describe uh, what, you, what you see in that area. Sure. So. Asian Americans, those who are in favor of racial preferences generally, have the difficult task of trying to prove to the American public that Asian Americans, in fact, to maintain the sort of rainbow coalition argument, support a policy that has been shown empirically to penalize them. And the way that these pro-racial preference advocates have done so is to fudge the polling data by intentionally phrasing questions in a way that would lead any individual that has a very basic rudimentary understanding of affirmative action to support the policy. The number one polling organization for Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders in the US is AAPI data, and they're run by left-wing advocates, essentially. These, they put out a statistic a few months ago that 70% of Asian Americans support affirmative action. That does not make sense when you're shown empirically that this policy penalizes this racial group and that this is the basis of the Harvard case specifically. The question that they asked these Asian Americans that were polled was, do you favor or oppose giving greater access to blacks, women, and other racial minorities. And 70% responded, of course. Who wouldn't want to give access to blacks, other minorities, and women? And so much of the mainstream media ran with that statistic. But in a recent report, I dug into that finding, and I noticed that this organization used to provide a much more honest measure of affirmative action prior to the uh, lawsuit against Harvard reaching the Massachusetts District Court in 2018. That question wasn't perfect, but it asked Asian Americans, in general, do you think affirmative action programs designed to increase the number of black students and other minorities on college campuses are a good thing or a bad thing? And the support went from 70% to the low 50s. And in fact, this particular survey broke down the Asian American racial category into the six largest Asian origin groups, which is still not done much in major surveys. And it showed that Chinese Americans, a majority oppose affirmative action when they're actually told what the policy does. And so Asian Americans have mobilized against the use of racial preferences because of all the data showing that it penalizes them. And of course, this group you know, would mobilize against racial preferences dating back to as early as 1983 in cases of UC Berkeley, Harvard, Princeton, Yale, for example, in the early <coughs> 1980s. At that point, much of the pushback against racial preferences and Asian American discrimination was actually done by on-campus student groups, of course we've seen that sort of change. So Asian Americans, specifically Chinese Americans, have long been opposed to racial preferences. That holds true today and attempts to show by pro-racial preference advocates that that's not in fact the case are, are intellectually dishonest. Right. Yeah, and that, that does seem to be increasing, I think, probably as the share of the U.S. population that is Asian increases, and there's more of a consolidated sense of identity. You do see more organizing among Asians for maintaining rigor in some of these selective high schools, but also ag against affirmative action. Um, and I think that your research has helped to flesh out a point that Jason was making early on, um, which is that there has been a consistent uh, result in polling that shows that Asian Americans and Americans of all groups, including blacks, uh, tend to oppose affirmative action when the sort of the details of what these policies actually are, are revealed very clearly. I wonder, David, I think it's important that 
one of the arguments made for, in favor of affirmative action is that it leads to better outcomes for sort of underrepresented minorities. It's not just a fairness question, it's partially a, a results question. And I believe that your, your research has gotten in a little bit into the mismatch question, um, which was discussed a little bit in the first panel. Um, is it beneficial to blacks in some cases who might come from underperforming high schools to go to these selective schools or, or not? I wonder if you, if you have any, any comment on that um, and sort of what your perspective on the mismatch question is. Well, let me uh, speak specifically to my knowledge and experience as a law professor, because law is maybe the most outrageous example of how affirmative action is misused and should be deemed to be misused, even if you're generally a supporter of it. And what I mean by that is this. All law schools need to be accredited by the American Bar Association. The American Bar Association is insistent that law schools meet an undefined standard of diversity. They won't tell you exactly what it is, but if they don't like how many, especially African American students, they will threaten your accreditation, which they in fact did to my law school about 20 years ago, which is why I got interested in the question. The other thing that's special about law schools is that for students to become lawyers, they actually have to pass the bar. So it's not enough to say, well, they benefit from being around other students who are more ambitious or the name of the law school is, you know, may help their uh, ultimate career even if they don't do especially well at law school. They actually have to pass the bar exam. Uh, a third thing that's unique about law schools, or maybe it's not unique, but I know it's true of law schools, is that every law school pretty much knows uh, if you have a score of X or below on the LSAT, you are very unlikely to pass the bar. Rick Sander just came out with a paper about this at a few law schools, <clears throat> but I was aware of this because when I wrote an op-ed about this for the Wall Street Journal, I got all these messages from deans and whatnot, don't, don't tell people that I told you this, don't quote me, but, <clears throat> and in other words, there, there's, you know, if you're at a law school where your median LSAT is, let's say 160, the kids who get 162 or 163, they're passing at 98%, maybe the 156s and 157s are passing at 94%, still great. But then there's some inflection point, let's say 153, where if you get below that, 80% of the students are failing the bar. Everyone knows this, and the ABA's reaction to this, if you tell them, if we, meet your goals. The only way to do that is to take in the under 153s, they're all gonna fail the bar. The ABA says, we don't care, do it anyway. And I was on a panel in front of the US Civil Rights Commission. At the end of the panel discussion, uh, the commissioners asked if there's anything else I would like to add. I said, I don't want to add anything, but my colleague here is from the ABA. Ask him this question. Does the ABA, when they're measuring diversity outcomes, only measure inputs, or do they care and check how well the students do once they're in, how many actually graduate law school, and how many pass the bar? And he acknowledged very explicitly, we don't care about anything but admissions. So what you have is the ABA forcing law schools to take in students against their policies in every other area who they know are very unlikely to ever become lawyers. And if I did, I did some, I, I don't have good empirical data, but quick uh, data in my head, about 42% of African American law students who matriculate at law school either fail out of law school or don't pass the bar. And at schools like Harvard or Michigan or whatever, it's almost none who don't do that, so which means in turn that at the bottom half of law schools, there are many law schools where more than half of the students who matriculate who are African American never become lawyers. And that is just, in my view, besides being Illegal. I mean, grossly immoral because you don't warn the kids. You don't tell them, hey, look, you could come here, but just so you know, people with your LSAT almost never pass. They're told the opposite. Everyone, we wouldn't take you if we didn't think you were qualified, right? And then the student wastes three years, $200,000, and goes and becomes a teacher or an accountant, which they could have done to begin with, but they never actually become a lawyer. And, it's just, and the, the fact that no one else but me seems especially outraged by, by this in the legal profession is itself outrageous. Yeah, very, very quick follow-up. I'm, I'm wondering if you could break the tie between Rick and Jim in that, do you think that the students are better off going to a selective school because they have more ambitious peers and maybe they're helped a little bit by the high rigor at the schools? Or do you think that they're actually worse off 
by going to a school that maybe is more rigorous than their LSAT would qualify them for because they feel outcompeted. I don't know if you have results on this question. I just, I just want to know what you think. My, I would speculate without having really good data on this that if you're going to Harvard and are able to pass the bar, you're better off going to Harvard even if you're, because there is, law is a very status conscious profession and just the fact that you went there is very helpful. And once you get beyond the schools where just the name carries you, you're probably worse off. But I really think it often, I mean, what I would like to see, if to the extent that affirmative action continues, I think something that should be a relatively non-controversial policy and shouldn't just apply to affirmative action but across the board is that law schools and, other, and universities and other professional schools should be transparent. Here is what the average, here are our admission statistics, here's where you fall, here's how successful at school and in different majors people with your criteria get. You still want to come here knowing you have a 70% chance of, of not making a passing the bar? Well, at least you know that you're going to have to work harder and you're at a disadvantage and we're not pretending that uh, all the, that, that, I mean, why we use the LSAT? We use it because we know that the students who have higher LSATs tend to be more successful academically. So we have, we have this weird situation where we pretend that the criteria we're using for admissions isn't relevant to ultimate success, and it's false, and it's a lie, and the law schools are engaging in ABA-sponsored, ABA-required misrepresentation to their applicants. And I'd be much happier with the situation, although one could still, of course, oppose it from action on the grounds, if there was transparency and students were told that, uh, look, if you want to try for, if you want to be that, one, one, you know, look to the left, look to the right, two of you won't be getting, becoming lawyers, then you know, at, least that's, at least the student has now had that um, knowledge and ability to decide rather than uh, being lied to about their prospects. So when we've now heard that affirmative action fails at its purpose of redressing historic racial discrimination, because as David's saying, it doesn't actually lead to better outcomes in many cases, we've also heard from all three panelists previously that it often fails on the diversity rationale, uh, because uh, quite a lot of the, the students who are beneficiaries of it are not necessarily coming from starkly different backgrounds from the median student of, uh, you know, of a white background who are, attend these schools. They're often high income, they're often immigrant groups, et cetera. Can you talk a little bit about the shifting rationale uh, legally for affirmative action through the years, from Backey to Gruder uh, to now, um, and how that you know, even its supporters have never been able to make up their mind about what the purpose of the policy is. They insist we must have it, but they, you know, they seem to always change their minds about why. Yeah, sure, I'm happy to do that. Um, I wanna, I guess, start with just a minor point before I forget it, which is this concept that racial preferences in higher education missions somehow redresses historic discrimination. Um, you know, I think that is, regardless of whether you're a supporter or an opponent of racial preferences, I think that's, in my view, a, a relatively silly argument that would require, I guess, you to look at individuals as representatives of a much broader group because the people who are in the position to get racial preferences at some of the elite colleges like Harvard and Yale or you know, even uh, some of the, the, the state schools across the country, they are in a much, much, much better position than I would say a lot of other Americans uh, that are you know, not applying, not, not even applying to those schools. With respect to the different rationale, I think the rationale that a lot of, that pretty much every proponent that I know of, of racial preferences in higher education really believes in is that concept of remedying discrimination. Um, that's something that has really carried the day. If you look at, read the briefs um, from, you know, Baki, cases like that, it's, uh, you know, the scholarship. A lot of the scholarships have, have, has been focused on this concept of redressing historical discrimination, remedying past discrimination. It was, I think, it, during the Gruder decision where the concept of uh, diversity really took a hold, kind of jumping off of Justice Powell's solo, solo opinion in Baki, uh, where a lot of the proponents, they say, well, we don't really buy, buy this diversity rationale, or even if we do buy it, it's not the best rationale. But because this is something that has garnered a majority of the Supreme Court, that's something that in the briefs, you know, naturally, they've addressed, they've talked about since that term. 
But here's a twist. We've actually seen in the last, I would say, um, especially, I would say last 10, 20 years, but especially took off in the last two or three years, this argument of remedying broad-based uh, racial preferences in the name of remedying past discrimination come back into play. Uh, you know, they've al always existed um, in some contexts in the public contracting context, but now they're coming back into play because you've seen a lot more programs, reparations proposed, so-called reparations being proposed by San Francisco, California, that says we're going to give $5 million to each black resident who has lived here since 1996, or who has lived here for 13 years since 1996. Um, and what these purport to do is to remedy past discrimination. But the crazy thing is, you know, the only way that these make sense at all is if you look at sort of equality before the law as this broad-based collective equality of outcomes rather than how I look at it, which means, which is equality of rights on an individual level. That means an individual, regardless of uh, membership in a racial group is entitled to the full panoply of civil rights regardless uh, uh, of one's membership in a racial group. So I think that's the dichotomy. Mm -hmm. So Renu, I, w I wonder if you could get us started on the solution side of things. If, if at any point during the course of your research, um, it's occurred to you, well, this, this seems like an unfair system. It isn't really benefiting the people it's meant to benefit, but we don't necessarily want to throw out the goal of, uh, you know, creating a diverse society overall, and it's possible that colleges could continue to play a, a role in that goal. Uh, have you considered what might be a better system, a fairer system, that would actually lead to more viewpoint diversity on campuses, um, that would potentially allow for racial representation without having to do the hard balancing uh, that most of the people in this audience are opposed to? Sure, so I think the point brought up in the last panel, which is that if you still want to garner some sort of diversity with the intention of helping disadvantaged students, then the way to do that is not uh, an admissions tip based on race or ethnicity, but rather an admissions tip based on socioeconomic diversity, so one's socioeconomic status. Now, at Harvard specifically, about the majority of Harvard's incoming classes come from the top 15 to the top 20% of earners in the United States. So there's an extreme lack of income diversity, socioeconomic diversity at Harvard. And what recent surveys by Harvard student newspaper, The Crimson, has found is that that has translated to, in the class of 2025, for example, only 1.4% of first years in 2025, so this was done in 2022 last year, only 1.4% identifying as very conservative, only 7.2% identifying as somewhat conservative, only 18.6% identifying as moderate, and 72.4% of incoming freshmen at Harvard identifying as predominantly liberal. What's more, in that survey it was also shown that nearly 50%, about 49.8% of incoming freshmen said that they supported, for example, defunding the police. Now, these have been described, for example, as luxury beliefs in the past. So an admissions tip based on socioeconomic diversity could perhaps help address that. And if the educational benefits of diversity was the justification first articulated by Justice Powell and then recapitulated by Sandra Day O'Connor for racial preferences, the specific educational benefit that Powell spoke of was the robust exchange of ideas, viewpoint point diversity on college campuses. And racial preferences, as the Harvard data I just mentioned showed, have not led to that. Whereas I think if you're going, if you want broader diversity, then of course, you know, Powell's original intention of admitting a football player from the Midwest or a pianist, various forms of diversity, diversity properly understood, is of course a solution. But I know that students for fair admissions, even in their briefs, for example, have advocated for perhaps an admissions tip based on socioeconomic status. 
Yeah, it, it seems likely, I think, that in the decision, the conservative majority will address the types of diversity that they continue to endorse and maybe even speak broadly in a way that's not sort of legally binding about how universities should go about continuing to, to reach that mission. Any, any final comments from either David or Wen on that, the solutions side of things? Yeah, let me, let me just start. Um, you know, I always try to find something I disagree with the panelists on, even though we agree on many of the issues. From my personal perspective, I don't think that diversity should be viewed as necessarily a good. When you're talking about, you know, uh, university admissions or universities being designed as uh, places, at least in theory, for the best performers, you know, I think I think that could yield what people might consider a diverse class. But if you know all the top performing uh, students or all the top performing applicants um, in to a university are say black or Asian or white. I don't think there's anything wrong with just admitting the best performers at a university. I think that's a role of the university. But I do want to get it to two things on the, on the solution side, and those were all both alluded to, I think, on the first panel. Um, one, I do think that a lot of the solutions have to come from the pre-K to 12 level in ensuring that students are better prepared for academic rigor. And I think the public school system has worked out for many students, but it has also failed many students. So to the extent that we've seen competition in the marketplace uh, drive innovation in fields like technology, I think there's no reason why we shouldn't see competition in the marketplace drive innovation in the education system, whether that comes in the form of private schools or public charter schools. I think when schools and when students and parents are given the full panoply of options, the better performing schools will thrive, the worst performing schools will fail, and it'll in order to the benefit of the students. The second thing I want to talk about is this uh, economic opportunity, which I think one of the panelists, perhaps P Professor Bradley, alluded to this morning, where you shouldn't have to. I, I think education provides a great opportunity for many, many people, but it shouldn't be the only path to success. I think we should have uh, rethink uh, barriers to economic opportunity. You have to say, oh, you need a four-year college degree and I think even a master's degree to run a daycare in Washington, D.C. Uh, you know, there are so many, so many barriers to economic opportunity and some of those are education dependent. So at the same time that I'm talking to you about the importance of an education for a lot of people, I, I'm also sort of stressing that it should not be a requirement to every single pathway to success in America. So um, I'm not sure if I agree with whether or not about the diversity issue. My daughter is a high school senior, uh, so I just went through this whole process. Colleges sell themselves to parents and students as a four-year sleepaway camp, basically, uh, as opposed to education. Maybe that's what people want. I don't know. But clearly, the educational aspect of it is, is only they, they talk about it a lot less than other things like how many clubs they have and so forth. So there's clearly some idea that we want, you know, fun the time. But one thing I object to with the whole diversity rationale is that it originated um, in 1978 when the population of the United States was over 80% uh, white, about 13% African American black, and 5% Hispanic, but most Hispanics at that time were mostly considered to be white uh, uh, by, by law and custom, and less than 1% Asian American, less than 1% uh, Native American, yeah, I think, combined. And thus, when we're talking about diversity, we're really saying it'd be good to have some African American um, input into these schools for you know, a variety of reasons. You, know, you don't want to be a citizen in late 20th century America without having black classmates. But since the 1970s, between massive immigration from all over the world and much higher rates of intermarriage, all of the relevant groups have become extremely internally diverse. So we talk about Asian Americans. We're talking about people descended from about 65% of the world's population. Everyone from Bangladeshis to Filipinos. And by the way, the haphazardness of these classifications, it was originally proposed in the Federal Register that South, East a South Asians, like Indians, Pakistanis, Bangladeshis, be white, and a small Indian American lobbying group got wind of this, and they 
<laughs> lobbied, and they were switched to Asian at the last minute because no one really cared. There were very few of them in the country at the time, so it wasn't a big deal. Uh, so, but, you know, so, and when we talk, for example, about Asian American success in education, we're really talking almost entirely about Chinese, uh, Indians, Koreans, and Japanese. The other groups, don't, some of them are below average, some of them are slightly above average, some of them are around average. So one problem we have, oh, so if you're at Harvard and you have a soft quota on Asians, you're gonna probably take the child of the Indian engineer or the Chinese, uh, or Chinese American doctor because those are, they pay full tuition, they're most repaired, and you're not gonna, you're gonna, you're gonna pass over uh, the, the sons of the Vietnamese fishermen. And some of the Vietnamese fishermen could easily ask, in like let's say the Fisher case in Texas, well you already have a thousand Mexican Americans that you've admitted, you've admitted no Vietnamese Americans, how is adding the one more Mexican American adding to diversity uh, when, and not me because somehow I'm just Asian? It strikes me as a very reductionist, racist, racialist way of looking at people. And it's all the categories, like this African Americans include, to take two famous examples, everyone from Barack Obama to Clarence Thomas. Think about their backgrounds, uh, Gullah speaking. Clarence Thomas, who's a single mom on public assistance versus Barack Obama, one white parent, one African uh, royalty parent, uh, and so forth, the same category. Why are they adding diversity in the same way? And you know, we shouldn't neglect whites. Why is white, why, it's very dangerous to try to get people to think of themselves as white. That's how our system is geared towards. Uh, the white identity, what will, whites range legally for everyone from Iceland to Morocco to Armenia. These are extremely different people, different cultures. Uh, I, as a Jewish guy from New York, don't think I have that much culturally in common uh, with, with, with people who live in Appalachia, although we both you know, have similar skin complexions. This idea we're all somehow uh, diverse by these reductionist classifications that were invented by the government in 1977, and which, by the way, specifically when the point of federal register, register said, these are not meant to be used for eligibility for any programs. They were not even intended for this purpose. Uh, is just is just crazy to me. And I think we should get away from uh, thinking if universities want to. Uh, uh, to us, supply diversity as part of their summer camp experience, they should actually have to sit down and justify, well, what do we mean diversity? Why are these groups the ones we look at? And we shouldn't just be using these random classifications. Time for questions. Please raise your hand and the uh, microphone will come around. Over here. Thanks. Um, anyway, thank you uh, for all for being here. Uh, it's a great panel. And my question is about whether there may, in the long run, be a market solution to this problem. In that our universities seem to be more and more focused, especially the elite ones, on social justice as being engines for social justice primarily and only secondarily as engines for production of knowledge. And the more that they focus on social justice, does that in some way uh, detract from their brand as sources of excellence? You know, whereas, uh, for example, uh, when I was growing up, if somebody went to Harvard, everyone would just assume they were really, really smart and that they learned a tremendous degree if they went there. I'm not sure that people would have the same assumption anymore uh, based on what Harvard is doing to itself. And that applies to many um, elite schools. And, and just to make it concrete, and then I'll, I'll let you answer. You know, I have a friend who spent his whole life bragging that he went to Harvard. He went twice. And if you knew him for five minutes, you knew that. <laughs> and then <laughs> once his kids applied to college and couldn't go to Harvard, all of a sudden he says, it doesn't matter where you went to college. <laughs> I, I think Harvard admissions should be random. <laughs> I literally, I didn't, I'm not making this up. So, you know, at a certain point, people just say it, it doesn't matter or at least those schools, it doesn't matter anymore. Do you think that, that eventually that message will get out if things continue as they're going? Any sense that uh, the, sh <laughs> the shine is coming off of the elite schools, that uh, more people are aware that they, the value add isn't quite the same as it used to be? I mean, in my, my opinion, I don't normally agree with my left-wing friends of the academy about much, but on the fact, on the issue of replication of hierarchy, what the elite universities are in the business of is the replication of hierarchy. One reason they, one reason they are so intensely committed to racial preferences of the sort they engage in is because it allows them to 
portray themselves as, oh, look, we're, we're into social justice because our student picture looks like the United Colors of Benetton uh, ads from the 80s. Uh, but really, their job is to make sure that whatever criteria they're using will be accepted by the investment banks and the elite, other elite institutions as, um, a, a, as, a, as the entering ticket to uh, certain L, the high echelon of society. So my guess would be that you know there are the ideal people who are ideologically committed to all sorts of things. If their reputation started, if it started to become a problem, they would switch. So right now, social justice is hostile into that. If it turned out that investment banks, uh, that Goldman Sachs was demanding that everyone take four semesters of economics or they wouldn't get hired, then they move to that because they have to make sure their students are getting those jobs. So I think the market, uh, so the market can determine this, but I don't think that's going to take the shot off. I think that may change their policies. Any other questions? In the back over here. Thank you. I'm um, just curious, so there are at least a few states that I'm aware of, I think California and Washington come to mind, um, that I think have constitutional provisions prohibiting uh, racial discrimination in admissions, if that's right. Are you, I mean, are you familiar with those? And how has that in practice affected the admissions process and the education process in those states? Um, so I just, I'm very open-ended. I just was curious whether you're, you have any thoughts on that. Yeah, yeah, definitely. So California is one of those states. Uh, it has a constitutional amendment that uh, uh, bars racial preferences in public contracting, public education, and public employment. Uh, since that was adopted, I think in 90, 1996, it's really led to um, I think the positive story is that it's really led to very beneficial outcomes for all students that have attended the top UC schools. Um, the, the twist on that is that, and the other positive story is that the legislature actually tried to repeal it, and, and I think it went up uh, on the ballot box in 2020 or around that time, and it was overwhelmingly rejected in pretty much every county in California, even the progressive ones, and there are a lot of them. Um, the, the negative spin on that is that I think we are seeing, or at least I've heard anecdotal reports of universities in California trying to discriminate, kind of sort of uh, covertly discriminate, whether that would be, as I think Professor Banks said this morning, reading the applications of students to try to, to, try to figure out a proxy for their membership in a racial group or requiring for faculty hires. Uh, diversity statements, asking faculties to, to confirm their uh, con commitment to diversity and to, to say how much they would increase the diversity on the campuses. Uh, and we've seen other governmental entities, uh, the state of California, uh, that you know just really don't care and have passed uh, laws instilling racial preferences, even racial quotas, uh, in areas uh, of public employment and public contracting. Anyway, and you know the problem with state constitutions is that if you want to enforce them, you can't sue in federal court. You have to sue in state court. And a lot of state courts, you know, they are mixed, but a lot of state courts aren't very receptive to those claims. So it's kind of an evolving process, even in California. And if I might just add, I think the states in which uh, there's been some sort of state constitution law or mandate, something passed to bar the use of racial preferences at those state universities specifically California and the University of California system, really provides insight into what colleges and universities are going to do moving forward if the Supreme Court does, in fact, strike down racial preferences as it's expected to do soon. So, for example, uh, the UC system is now test blind. It went test blind in 2021. Now, what that means is we're seeing this movement of colleges and universities going test optional as a sort of workaround, a potential strike down of affirmative action, because Asian Americans, for example, tend to score quite highly just empirically on the SAT and the ACT compared to other racial minority groups. The UC system is test blind, meaning they don't even allow applicants the option of t submitting their test scores. So if you're applying to UC Berkeley or UCLA, which are sort of, you know, the crown jewels of that system, and you submit your SAT and or ACT scores, they're just going to throw that part of your application out. So 
what a lot of these state university systems have done with respect to affirmative action bans in higher education in those states is eliminate test scores, for example. And that seems like one of the main ways colleges and universities are going to continue discriminating on the basis of race going forward. Yeah, so I mean, the California state schools, when they were banned from uh, using a race, cheated gradually over time and were cheating increasingly. Uh, there's empirical studies showing it, but still they were using race less dramatically than other schools. That wasn't enough, so they tried to get uh, the proposition repealed, but they failed. And then, uh, as we just heard, they eliminated the SAT entirely. This really troubles me, uh, eliminating of the SAT, because again, my daughter just went through the college process, and I read all these. We didn't hire a consultant, we didn't go through that. She did very well anyway, uh, uh, I'm very happy. But anyway, um, but people do, and you, read, you can at least read books about it, and all, almost everything else that colleges look at, what internships you got, letters of recommendation, the courses you take, these are all things that the upper middle class and beyond students know how to game, and their parents pay a lot of money to help them game it. And the SAT is to some extent you know, leveling the playing field, so the smart kid from the working class family who doesn't know how you get into Harvard or, or how to get into UC Berkeley can still show that they're academically competent. And if UC Berkeley and you know, and the other states who are looking at it. So they're going to be looking at, oh, what internships did you, oh, you have a letter of recommendation from one of our prominent alumni, right? But who's getting that? It's not the kids that you really want to give a chance to. So I think it's, a, it's really, there's a, there's a possibility at least that that sort of thing can happen as a reaction. It could, we could wind up in some ways in a worse situation than we are now, where it's either the system's even more gameable, even more uh, geared towards the kids who already have lots of advantages. Uh, and yes, they'll have their you know, subtle quotas of minority students, but uh, they'll, they'll have even less you know, diversity socioeconomically and otherwise among the rest of the student body. What do we do over here? Hi. Uh, thank you for an excellent panel. Now, we live in a competitive world. China, Russia, they all work on a meritocracy. Has academia considered who we're putting out to compete 20, 30 years from now? I mean, you know, we just don't live on an isolated island anymore divided by two oceans. And this ought to be considered. I mean, we need people, who, the best people to do things. I'm a physician and I'm shocked, appalled to see what's happening in medicine. And uh, it's very obvious there, because, you know, doctors, you tell them you gotta line up, they line up very quickly. Uh, but it's scary to see what's gonna happen to this country in the future. So the question is, do academics ever cons consider that we're in a competitive, do academics ever consider that we're living in a competitive world? And someone, is there someone talking up about that? I mean, the underlying theory, uh, for whatever, you know, which you could obviously disagree with, is that because of historical and institutional racism that continues to have effects, and in fact, by ensuring that all groups are represented in medical schools and law schools and whatnot, we're actually going to, in the long term, and maybe even in the short term, be improving American productivity because we're keep making sure that the, that the groups in question that would otherwise be excluded get to reach their full potential. Uh, obviously, that depends on a lot of empirical uh, data about whether uh, that, that's actually how it works out or whether, you know, whether you're engaging, as some have argued, counterproductive. But that's the, they do think about it. They think about it from an, you know, they have their own underlying ideology that they lens that they see it through. And they also, I think, troublingly think that race is a, um, there's not just been historically, which it obviously has been an important aspect of American life, but that's inevitable, and that the only way to have a fair society is to ensure that we keep getting broken up into groups, measure those groups, and ensure each group is getting their quote unquote fair share. I think it's a very pessimistic view. I think it's also doesn't have to be that way. I always, I, the example I like to give, if you went back to 1960, and when JFK was running for president, people thought he couldn't get elected because uh, he was Catholic, and he really couldn't in a sense because the only reason he got elected was that even though millions of Protestants who normally voted Democrat voted Republican, millions of Catholics who normally voted Republican voted for him for identity politics, right? If you told people back in 1960, then 2020, Joe Biden gets elected as president as Catholic, has a half black, half Indian, black identified running mate, Senate Majority Leader's Jewish, House 
uh, Speaker of the House is Catholic, six Catholics, two Jews on the Supreme Court, people would be astonished. They, they, they would say, wait, the Catholics are running the country with the help of the Jews? How could that be? <laughs> right? It would just be unbelievable. But we don't even think about it now. Except when abortion comes up, people say, oh, too many Catholics in the court. But other than that, no one even thinks about it. I think that 60 years from now, we can have the same thing with regard to race, but not if we just assume that we have to be broken up. And I think at the grassroots, we're doing that. You see, you, know, you walk around New York or any big city, any small town even, people of all mixtures are together, uh, dating, marrying, having children. And and we're moving towards, I think, a multicultural American identity that the grassroots is happening and the elite is actually oddly trying to stop it. Yeah. May I have one more question from this fellow in the front? Um, this kind of dovetails on, on the comment you were just making. I'm curious from the other panelists as well. Um, if you sort of thinking more about five, ten years from now and the state of affirmative action, whatever that is, um, in the future, if we kind of play the chessboard forward a bit and see it from a time-lapse perspective, considering where culture is going, where uh, social movements are going, and maybe where the main interest groups are going to apply pressure to whatever direction, does anyone have a point of view on kind of what the shape of this looks like? five, ten, something like that years from now? That, that, that's a really interesting question. I think that, you know, one of the, very optimistic overall, but one of the things that strikes me as, as uh, somewhat alarming in the past two, uh, two or three years or so is that I feel like the political discussion or the discussion on um, our everyday lives has gotten more and more partisan. Um, so I think the pessimistic view to look at it is you'll have you know a lot of people um, uh, on, feel strongly on one side, a lot of people feel strongly on another side on an already divisive issue like racial preferences and affirmative action in higher education. But I do think that you know the pendulum always kind of swings back, and that's one of the things I guess to end it from my perspective that really. Um, it really invigorates me with discussions like the, the one we had right now and the one we had this morning is that you have people with a lot of different perspectives come together and share really, really good ideas. So I think if we can get back to the culture of sharing those ideas, get back to the culture of you know, vigorous but friendly debate, I think you know, that's, that's my hope at least for the next five to 10 years. I'll just briefly add that you mentioned interest groups. Um, some research that I just finished looking at, based on all of the amicus briefs that were filed in both students for fair admissions cases, I'll first say, based on a survey that Pew Research Center published in March 2022, it went viral. It's, in my opinion, the most recent excellent measure of public opinion on affirmative action because it states quite clearly do you support the use of race as a factor in college admissions? 74% of Americans said no. Yet 87% of the advocacy organizations that filed or joined a brief in the Students for Fair Admissions cases said the opposite. They, they advocated in favor of racial preferences. So that's the discrepancy. You have 26, only 26% 26 of American citizens say that they support racial preferences, but 87% of the advocacy organizations that filed briefs or joined briefs in this case support racial preferences. That's the degree of mismatch. So I think in terms of what will the next five to 10 years look like, it will involve, I think, also somehow either on the conservative side of the issue, a greater rise of advocacy organizations, the libertarian side of this issue, or it'll simply involve having the advocacy organizations that are already in existence being less captured by racial preference activists. Uh, so there is a substantial mismatch between public opinion and the opinion of advocacy organizations that claim to represent public opinion on this. Um, first, my publisher would kill me if I didn't mention that if you're interested in these racial classifications issues <laughs> that I've been talking about, I have a book that came out in July called Classify the Untold Story of Racial Classifications in America. But on this issue, I don't know what will happen in five or ten years, but here's one thing to look out for. Harvard just released a study 
of its relationship to slavery about how Harvard itself had slaves back in the 18th century, how some of its donors owned slaves, how some of the donors dealt, were in business with people who owned slaves, and their conclusion was that Harvard should engage in reparations for this, and the way they should do that is to find the descendants of the slaves that Harvard had and compensate them through admissions and financial aid and maybe other ways. But also, all African Americans who are descendants of slaves should be eligible for Harvard reparations. So this is a very interesting issue, which I raise, which I talked about a little bit in the book, which is: is American, is descendant, being a descendant of American slaves a racial classification that would fall under a ban on using race in admissions, or is it a political classification, historical, whatever, the way being a member of an Indian tribe has been considered. Uh, and one possible compromise, which may not make every, anyone happy, but may be uh, a, a, a way to balance it uh, politically, is that since, as everyone has sort of acknowledged, the really underlying impetus for affirmative action is not diversity, but the felt need to compensate for historical discrimination against African Americans, you could do that by having a preference for American descendants of slaves that, is, that would not include children of African immigrants and so forth, and would not include Hispanics or any other group that might be included, but would be limited to that 10% or so of the population. So you wouldn't need all the DEI stuff, you wouldn't need the broad affirmative action programs, uh, and Harvard seems prepared to test that. Justice Kavanaugh asked about an oral argument, so it's under the justice's mind, and we'll just have to see if that is uh, something that universities pursue and what the Supreme Court would say about that. Okay, thought-provoking stuff. Well, please join me in thanking the panel, folks, and thank you for coming. We're going to get started with our uh, final, final discussion uh, of the day. If you could uh, take your seats. Um, Linda Chavez is chairman of the Center for Equal Opportunity, uh, an organization that promotes Colorblind, equal opportunity, and non-discrimination. She's a syndicated columnist, writes often about issues dealing with race and ethnicity and politics. She's also a television commentator, book author, and a former staff director of the U.S. Civil Rights Commission. Um, thank you for being here, Linda. I'd thank also you. like to add on a personal note that um, one of the great things about my job is getting to meet people that uh, inspired me a long time ago to become an opinion journalist, and Linda certainly uh, one of those people, so I'm, I'm uh, very happy she was able to, to be here today. Thank you for, for coming. Um, as I just mentioned, you had a, an organization called the Center for Equal Opportunity, and just full disclosure, I am an unpaid member of Linda's Board of Directors at uh, CEO. Um, equal Opportunity used to be how we defined affirmative action. Uh, and I think there's long been broad-based support for affirmative action in that sense in this country. Uh, but the meaning of the term has evolved over the decades, and I wondered if you could start by talking about how it has evolved and what it means in practice today versus what it used to mean. Uh, that's a very good question, and, and by the way, thank you so much uh, for inviting me and for being here. I have a great affection for the Manhattan Institute, my first book. Out of the Barrio was published uh, here at the Manhattan Institute. So it's great to be with you. Yes, the, the idea of equal opportunity. I mean, one of the things, one of the big debates today is about the concept of equity. Uh, equity is a very nice sounding word. You know, it sounds like, oh, well, we all ought to be in favor of equity. But then when you sort of drill down and say, what does equity mean? Well, equity, as it is uh, used by most of the people who promote the concept, is the idea that um, we should have essentially equal results and we should have equal representation, uh, often based on characteristics like race or sex, uh, in all of our institutions. And uh, while that in some utopian model might be something we could you know, hope to achieve at some point in, in the history of man, the fact is we've never achieved that in any society in the history of the world. And the means that would be used to achieve that, by and large, would have to be basically totalitarian means. You basically have to enforce that kind of structure. 
When, um, when I started the organization, I was very focused on the idea that what the law requires is that people be considered as individuals and without regard to their race, their sex, their national origin. And that the best that government could hope to do is to provide an equal opportunity for individuals to be able to achieve uh, to their maximum uh, gifts and hard work. And that to me was what the promise of the civil rights movement was all about. That uh, we would pass laws that say you cannot discriminate against anyone on the basis of race or sex or national origin. Um, but neither should you give preference to anyone on those bases, even if it is to make up for past wrongs. Um, that that system, it, particularly if you're not dealing with individuals who themselves have uh, experienced a discreet uh, discrimination and you're simply giving them some preference in order to make up for the wrong that was done individually to them. But if you're doing it in a broad sense, you're doing it on, based on membership in groups um, you really have gone against the whole promise of the civil rights movement. Okay. Um, we heard a little bit about this in the last panel, uh, but I think this um, defense of, of racial preferences and affirmative action is, is, is part of a, a, a broader attack on meritocracy in general that we're seeing. Um, we heard about uh, states making, or schools making the SAT optional. Um, we see it also at, uh, in, at the K through 12 level with specialized high schools and attempt here in New York to eliminate these exam schools or eliminate the exam itself. Um, is this something that will help minorities in, in, in the long run if we remove these barriers, if we remove uh, these uh, meritocratic uh, processes that we've long had in place? I mean, because all of this is being done in the name of helping um, underprivileged groups. Uh, wh wh what are your thoughts on that? Well, first of all, I mean, I have a long history um, in, in this area and having been born in 1947 um, and having graduated from high school in 1965, I was sort of on the cusp of when these programs were first being conceived of and thought of. Um, and the idea that uh, you're gonna help people by doing such things as wiping out the SATs, I'm here to tell you that I would not have gone to college if it not, had not been for my test scores. I was a miserable student in high school. I mostly skipped classes. Uh, thankfully, I skipped classes, stayed home, and read. Um, so when it came time uh, to decide what I was doing with my life, I'm from a very working class background. My father was a house painter with a ninth grade education. My mother worked in retail uh, with a high school education. No one ever talked to me about going to college, and I you know, never planned on going to college. But lo and behold, I was a receptionist at a beauty salon about a block and a half from the University of Colorado Denver Center. And a girlfriend came over to have lunch with me one day and said, uh, I'm gonna go over and enroll in a couple classes um, at the Extension Center at CU. Do you wanna come with me? And I thought, well, you know, I love to read books, so maybe I'll go and I'll look and see. Uh, if it had been, um, open admissions, that would have been fine, but it wasn't. You actually had to take a test, and it was on the basis of that test that I got in. It would not have been on the basis of my uh, grades. Uh, fast forward five years when I graduated in 1970 from the University of Colorado, the Ford Foundation decided it was going to offer some uh, fellowships. Uh, by this time, I had met my husband who decided that not only was I going to get up college degree, I was gonna get a PhD, something I'd never heard of. I'd never heard the expression, I didn't know what a PhD was, but he thought I should get one. And so um, I applied for a fellowship that the Ford Foundation was offering uh, for Mexican Americans in 1970. And uh, I was picked uh, as part of the class uh, of people to be interviewed. I got on an airplane for the first time in my life uh, I was by that time married and with a child. 
went in for my interview, which did not go particularly well. The, uh, in one of the interviewers tried to interview me in Spanish uh, for the whole time, a language which I did not grow up speaking. Uh, my family's been here a very long time. Um, then uh, one of the interviews complimented me on how well I spoke English. I was applying for a <laughs> PhD in English literature. Um, and then uh, the third interviewer said to me, well, um, you know, you've done very well. This has all been great. Um, but there's a problem with your graduate record exam scores. Well, I immediately became mortified, tried to explain that the night before I took the exam, my baby had colic, and I was up all night. And so I only scored in the 93rd percentile. And he said, well, that's the problem. And I thought, well, yeah, I should have scored in the 99th, I guess, in order to get this. No, the problem was my scores were too high. So in that five-year period, I went from being advantaged because I scored well on tests to being told I would not get the Ford Foundation Fellowship because I clearly wasn't disadvantaged, despite the fact I was economically disadvantaged. So um, that's sort of my snapshot. Yeah. I, I, I would also think that um, if, if, if you are someone uh, uh, on the left, who sees racism everywhere, uh, uh, something that, that permeates our institutions and society, meritocracy would be your best friend. Um, why would you want a school admissions official to take a holistic view of, of your child, for example, of you, um, versus being able to say, no, I got the test scores. I had the class rank of the average person at this school. Uh, I mean, uh, holistic admissions is what was, was, was done to Jews 100 years ago when Harvard said, yes, you're smart, um, uh, yes, you have good grades, but you're just not the Harvard type. Right. <laughs> well, um, I, and, and, and it was uh, you know, never fully defined, of course, what the Harvard type was. But this, it seems to me we're going back to, that, to giving that sort of deference to college admissions officials as we move away from, from meritocracy, and, and as an audience member mentioned earlier, um, you know, they're not doing this in South Korea. They're not doing this in India. They're not doing this in China. And if we want to continue to remain globally competitive, um, uh, it's something, uh, moving away from meritocracy doesn't seem to be the way to go. Well, first of all, you know, the Center for Equal Opportunity, and by the way, you can look up anything I reference in our studies uh, online at ceousa.org. But we did um, a study in 2018 that looked at a report done by Harvard itself, how Harvard was making these holistic decisions. And it turned out that uh, they actually looked at this question, and they found out if they only use grades and test scores, the admission rates for Asian students, Asian American students, would be 43% of the incoming class. It would be the single biggest group. Then they decided, well, what if you added other factors? And they looked at athletics, they looked at legacies, they looked at extracurricular activities, and sure enough, when you added those factors, the numbers came down for Asians, but they were still in the over 30%. Then they looked at uh, the question of personality, and they did interviews. And it turned out, lo and behold, Asian American students scored very poorly in personality. Uh, one could imagine the same group of interviewers thinking that uh, Jews scored badly uh, in, you know, say, 1920 uh, at the same institution. So uh, the idea of these kinds of holistic uh, reviews, if the intent is to deny to a group, by the way, which has faced enormous discrimination in this society. Chinese Americans were not allowed to become citizens. Uh, all Asians were, in fact, not allowed even to immigrate to the United States um, you know, f uh, during the early part of the 20th century. So, you know, clearly that's a problem. But I will say, Jason, that I don't know that I have a problem with schools deciding that they don't want to have grades and test scores be the determining factors. Some schools have basically open admissions. That's fine. 
Um, likelihood is they're not going to produce a lot of Nobel Prize winners. Um, they may not um, provide an education to their students um, that's going to get them to you know, end up in very high paying jobs. But if that's what a school wants to do, let them do it. What I object to is the fact that schools and the admissions process are a black box. We don't, for the most part, have any idea what the criteria are for admissions to colleges and universities. And I thought David uh, Bernstein's point about opening up, and, and not just opening up to you know, inspection to groups like mine. We file FOIA requests, and that's why we've done more than three dozen studies of admissions at uh, colleges, undergrad, med schools, and law schools, and uh, the military academies, by the way. Um, but um, letting the student know who gets in, even if a school was giving some sort of preference on the basis of race uh, or ethnicity, if the student knew, for example, that his or her test scores and grades were substantially below those of incoming, other incoming students, it might have an effect on whether or not that student decided to matriculate at that university. If they knew, for example, that you know, their scores were 150, 190 points lower on the SAT, and oh, by the way, no one uh, with their scores, or very few, maybe 10% or 20% of the students with scores similar to theirs, actually ended up graduating within four years, uh, or in the case of law school, ended up passing the bar, that would be very important. But right now, the system is such that students are not told that. So I think there ought to be a whole consumer advocacy uh, movement to try to open up the process so students who, parents and students who are applying to schools know exactly what the criteria are for admission and that once admitted, they know where they rank in terms of, uh, of the incoming class. Um, I mentioned this in my opening remarks and it came up again in the, in the previous panel. This, um, uh, this gap between um, elite opinion on topics like affirmative action and what everyday Americans think about them. And of course, affirmative action is not the only issue. Uh, I know you've encountered this uh, when it comes to uh, you know, bilingual education or school choice or voter ID laws. There's, there's, there's this gap between what you hear elites say uh, they want, what um, uh, uh, ethnic uh, leaders and racial leaders uh, profess while trying to speak on behalf of the entire group versus what uh, everyday, everyday um, members of those groups think. And I, and I, and I uh, wonder if you had any, any thoughts on, on that gap. And, and, and uh, this was also mentioned in the previous panel, what happened in California with Prop 209. And I think uh, uh, that's significant. In 2020, there was an effort to um, uh, reinstate racial preferences and admissions at the University of California system. And it was overwhelmingly rejected. You know, California is not West Virginia. California is a deep blue state, very progressive populations, uh, and they overwhelmingly rejected a return to racial preferences. And in addition to all the polling I cited that we heard today, that says something. That's the largest state, the most populous state in the country, and one of the most racially diverse states in the country. And they said no. Um, yet you turn on the television, you turn on the radio, you read the New York Times, you listen to NPR, you watch MSNBC, and you would think that uh, the entire country is in favor of racial preferences, and only uh, mean, hard-hearted, conservative Republicans are opposed to them. Well, you know, I do think that's uh, a very important point. And I would say that, you know, the whole attitude of uh, popular sentiment about education has dramatically changed. I think we used to look up to universities and colleges. We used to assume that if you got a degree, uh, particularly from a named school like a Harvard or uh, University of Michigan, University of Wisconsin, some of the better state schools, 
um, that it meant something. Um, and uh, I think that's why parents were willing to sacrifice to send their children to school and why students themselves were willing to sacrifice and borrow from those schools. You know, only a third of Americans end up graduating from college. Two thirds of Americans don't, and yet it is the taxes uh, paid uh, by everyone that go to support those uh, state schools. And we've recently seen a decline in enrollment in colleges, and by the way, uh, that decline is more significant among males than among females. We now have an imbalance, you know, back again when I started out, you know, it was more unusual for women to, uh, to go to college and certainly uh, to graduate with a four-year degree and particularly in fields like engineering. That's no longer the case. And I think there's a growing dissatisfaction and what uh, because schools are now so expensive, including state schools. I mean, it's not just the $85,000 a year that Harvard costs, at least that's the sticker price, uh, though many of the students uh, end up not paying anything like that. Um, there, a lot of students are mortgaging their futures um, by essentially taking out loans that it will take them decades to pay back, uh, if ever. And some of the dissatisfaction has to do with, you know, what kind of education they get when they get there. And um, I, I, I think that you, you know, that you would think, as you suggested, Jason, that there's going to be this, you know, huge dramatic effect throughout society if we quit using racial preferences in admissions. I think it's going to have a somewhat minimal effect. Part of it's going to be because schools will try to come up with other means. And by the way, there are means other means that they could use that I would not object to. U using, overcoming adversity, overcoming disadvantage says something about an individual. It's one of the reasons why you and I are both very, you know, pro immigrant The <coughs> fact that you work very hard to get here probably likely means that you're going to do well. Same thing uh, in getting to college. Um, you know, if, if you've overcome uh, adversity uh, in your life, um, you show a kind of you know stick to itness and and um, uh, a kind of drive that may bode well for the future. So there are ways you could come up with uh, other measures, but at the end of the day, uh, I don't think this is going to have um, a huge impact. I think most people are going to sort of say ho hum and and move on, and schools are going to adjust. One of the uh, um, byproducts of affirmative action that has not come up, um, I believe, today yet is stigma. The stigma associated with being a beneficiary of affirmative action. Um, um, I wanted to ask you about that because it's often played down. Um, uh, but. Who, what self-respecting person wants to be the affirmative action hire, wants to be the, um, the, the affirmative action uh, kid on campus that everyone knows only got there because the standards were, were lowered. Um, but it often does get played down by proponents of affirmative action. I, I'll give you a, a good example of this. Uh, as, as I'm sure you're aware, uh, Senator Elizabeth Warren has been accused of using, uh, claiming Native American ancestry to advance her self-professionally uh, as a law professor before she entered the Senate. Um, Boston Globe has reported on this, confronted her. She became indignant. I got where I got because of the, the, the hard work I did, she said. Um, and why wouldn't she? Who wants to be accused of that? But of course, Elizabeth Warren is a strong proponent of affirmative action to help blacks. And if you go to her and say, well, what about the stigma. <laughs> I'm sure she'll say, you know, you shouldn't have to worry about that. Right. So I'm wondering how, how big a deal is it, uh, this, this, this stigma associated with affirmative action? I think there is stigma. I think it is exacerbated by the mismatch. Mm -hmm. um, and so that at more elite public colleges, for example, where there is more preference, um, in the data that, that, that we've examined, you know, a school like George Mason, which basically uh, doesn't give preference on the basis of race and admissions. Um, if, if you are a black or Latino student going to George Mason, uh, you're not assumed to be a, quote, affirmative action uh, admittee. Uh, 
On the other hand, if you know you uh, were going to the University of Michigan uh, prior to the decisions or even subsequent to the decisions or some of the other more elite schools in the country, if you're black or brown, you are assumed to have gotten in because of some preference. And if, by the way, that's true and you got in uh, because of preference, what you may be doing is reinforcing stereotypes among those white students who are supposed to be there, according to Justice Powell, to learn from you and to be enriched by your diversity. Well, if they look and, and they see that all of the kids in their classes that are in the you know, bottom 10% happen to be black or brown, yeah, that's gonna, you know, there's diversity there, but it's gonna reinforce some rather negative stereotypes. So, so I think there is an impact. I think there is, I think we do have to recognize stigma. I've encountered it numerous times. I'm really, frankly, except for the Ford Foundation, which I didn't get anyway, I'm a little too old to have benefited uh, from those programs in higher education. But it's always assumed. Um, it's sort of always, in fact, um, I had a very um, nice review of my memoir um, in which, you know, the, the young reviewer writing said, you know, despite her being an affirmative action uh, beneficiary, uh, she has very good attitudes on this issue or something. I thought, excuse me, did you read the, <laughs> did you read the memoir? Uh, so, you know, um, it's, um, it, it, is, it is negative. But I think the, the more serious question is what it does to the beneficiaries uh, who have benefited because they've been given uh, preference in admissions who then don't graduate on time or end up, you know, thinking they're going to go into engineering but because they didn't end up at a school where you know, they might have gotten some help with remedial math, et cetera, that could, you know, steer them uh, into an engineering program that they could succeed in, uh, end up changing, you know, and becoming an ethnic studies uh, major, uh, which is going to produce a very different result in your paycheck when you, uh, when you graduate. So um, you have people who argue that affirmative action is needed to uh, uh, compensate for past injustices directed at a group. Um, you have people who say it's necessary for diversity, which is a, a ill-defined universal good, apparently. Um, and then you have another group that says um, these policies are necessary because without them, there'd be no black middle class. You're going to decimate the black middle class in this country. Or you wouldn't see the progress that women have made in this country without these policies that they're necessary for those reasons. How do you respond to that? Well, in part I respond that, you know, I, I'm a great believer uh, in the market. Um, and um, by and large, if you are discriminating against people who are qualified and capable uh, of doing uh, work, um, you're hurting yourself as an employer. So, um, I, you know, my, my guess is that most of the people uh, who succeed uh, succeed because they um, put in the work and put in the effort. So I think you, I think you would have had, we, we, we basically short-circuited the experiment on equal opportunity. We passed the Civil Rights Act in 1964, and then by 1968 we sort of introduced the concept of affirmative action, and by the early 1970s that affirmative action is more from being one where you cast a wider net, something I'm in favor of, uh, that you make sure there's a more diverse pool of applicants, perfectly fine in my view, uh, to being one in which you actually give preference. What would have happened if we had kept up the goal of equal opportunity? I think first of all, one of the things we would do, notice, is that things like SAT scores do matter. They do, their standardized tests do predict certain characteristics which make you able to succeed in certain fields, not all fields, but in academic fields, the kind of things that you require a four-year degree for, they generally do. And um, if we notice that um, black students' SAT scores were much lower, we might start questioning why that was the case and what kind of schools did they attend. 
I taught in affirmative action programs at the University of Colorado. We went out and recruited students, but it was in the early days. And one of the things we recognized was that students were not gonna graduate in four years. It was probably gonna take them five. And that first year, we were gonna be spending giving them the kind of remedial help uh, because they attended inferior schools. But we never really achieved uh, uh, that, uh, that goal because we short-circuited. We pretended that, you know, that Lyndon Johnson uh, metaphor that, you know, you can't take people who've been shackled for 200 years and then put them in the race. Um, you know, I think that's true, but it's also true that you don't put them across the finish line without their running the race and consider that an achievement. You have to give them the skills, the training, and the preparation to be able to allow them to run that race. And that's why I think uh, Professor Bradley's comments about elementary and secondary, that's where the action is. Affirmative action in college admissions or affirmative action in hiring, that ignores the problem, which is at the uh, much earlier level. And that is very complicated because it's not just education, it's also family structure. Um, and um, that's where we've missed the boat. Um, I'll ask uh, one more question and we'll, we'll turn it over to the audience. Uh, it seems like we've become uh, more and more race conscious in this country in recent years, sort of going in the opposite direction of the, of the civil rights movement that you referenced earlier, uh, racial essentialism, uh, uh, identity politics, critical race theory, DEI training, uh, the rise of figures like ta Coates and Ibram Kendi and Nicole Hannah-Jones. We're capitalizing the B in black again. Um, why, why do you think this has been the case? And, and where, you know, where do you think this trend is, is heading? Well, if you're given some preference based on race, then obviously you're gonna create a market for that. Okay. Yeah. But the one thing you didn't mention, which I, is I think the, the correlate to what's happened, um, among uh, racial minorities is that it's also, I think, pushed people into greater recognition of white identity. And white identity politics and white nationalism, I think, is extraordinarily dangerous and corrosive. And, um, and I think, you know, they're, they're sort of opposite sides of the coin and, um, and I think it's a, it's a terrible mistake to be moving in that direction. And by the way, it's happening at a time when classifications, I mean, you know, David knows this very well, they're much less meaningful. Yeah. People are mixed race and mixed, eth uh, mixed ethnic group. I've never liked race as a category just because I'm not sure that it's in any way scientific. Ethnicity <coughs> has always seemed to be uh, a much more accurate uh, reflection of at least culture, sometimes language uh, and history uh, than race is. So, but now we're becoming a nation that is so incredibly ethnically diverse and ethnically mixed that one wonders you know, what any of this is gonna mean 50 years from now. Okay, thank you. Uh, we'll take a few questions. Before we wrap things up here, uh, in the back. Thanks so much. Thanks so much for the discussion today. Um, it seems like we've pretty well substantiated that solving this problem comes down to K through 12. What do those some of those solutions look like? I can imagine some people saying, "Oh, it's you know a lot more." funding for public education, de Blasio's universal pre-K, et cetera, et cetera. In your view, what are some of these solutions? Well, look, I think funding can matter. Um, I think uh, how schools spend the money that they get matters. I think the training of teachers matters a great deal, and I think one of our great failures uh, as a society uh, is teacher education. Uh, teachers uh, are not trained in subject matter. Uh, they are trained in education and pedagogy uh, rather than focusing on what it is they're going to teach students. So I think more emphasis on that, opening up uh, to um, the profession of teaching to people who don't have education degrees um, would help. 
Uh, I think the way in which we uh, teach certain subjects, I mean, I think, you know, the new emphasis on phonics, it, it seems so, it, it's amazing to me that it has taken us this long to figure out the way that most of us in this room learn to read um, actually worked and so-called whole language didn't. Um, so, I mean, there are, there are lots, of, uh, uh, lots of things, but I do think the ability to choose the schools you go to. I've always said that, you know, despite having a really economically disadvantaged background, my parents weren't even married. They lived together for 32 years and my father married my mother uh, six months before he died. So I grew up in a very disadvantaged household. I'm here today largely because I went to Catholic school for 12 years. My parents at that time, Catholic school tuition was ranged from $100 to I think by the time I graduated $250 a year. Uh, and even as a house painter, my, my father was able to, to afford that and my mother who worked uh, as well. So I think choice is, uh, does matter. I think we need more testing, not less testing. You know, this idea of, you know, it's a horrible thing to teach to the test. Well, at least we'll know that the students learn something, uh, you know, and, you know, again, if you're teaching to the test and what's in the test matters and it, it encompasses reading and writing and arithmetic, that, you know, might be, uh, might be useful. So all of those things, I think, matter. Yeah, so just building on that, um, so I'm in the corporate world now, I've gone through the, this in education too, so I understand the, the policy implications of those, but uh, I kind of building on that, like, what can somebody like myself, or what can one do um, to address this maybe at, not just corporate, whatever institution, because most of these institutions are kind of overwhelmed by this DEI regime, right? So um, that's something I struggle with, not only finding other people that are willing to voice opinions uh, and, you know, go with the facts that have been brought up uh, in forums like this, but but even just at a loss to know, like, where, where do we start? So, yeah, just, do you have any thoughts on kind of what, what can some of us do uh, in, in, in these institutions? In the corporate world in, in particular? Yeah, that, that's, that's my application, but may, maybe it applies to other as well. Well, I mean, one of the things you can do is to, you know, support institutions that have a different point of view than some of, you know, than Jesse Jackson's groups or uh, Al Sharpton's groups, or I mean, which is where the corporate money goes to on, on subjects of race. Um, I welcome you to look at the Center for Equal Opportunity. Um, but, uh, you know, I also think that um, funding opportunities, you know, in terms of education, I was involved uh, for some years with actually someone who used to be a trustee at the Manhattan Institute who funded uh, programs to provide scholarships uh, to poor kids to go to Catholic schools. Um, I think those are, are very effective. I did that myself for two, uh, two students here in New York, and I think it made a, a, a difference in their lives. So, so there are op opportunities, but I also think it's important to speak out and to push back and not to fear. I mean, I've been called, you know, more names than you can imagine. Um, you know, it, you get used to it. Develop a thin, you know, develop a thicker skin. Uh, be willing to stand up. Um, and uh, I think, you know, when you have a critical mass of people who do that, it makes a difference. I completely agree with that, that more people need to speak out. Um, uh, I mean, we, we've, we've gotten to a point where, you know, uh, math is racist. Mm -hmm. Punct punctuality is white supremacy. Yeah. Um, someone who swam on the men's team last year is swimming on the women's team this year and winning all the races, and you're not supposed to have any problem with that. Or even notice it. Or notice it. <laughs> We're tearing down statues of Abraham Lincoln and erecting statues of George Floyd. S say something. Speak out about this stuff. I do not think, and I think a majority of Americans are with you. I, I, I really do. Um, uh, there are people who support this stuff. They have some megaphones, but there aren't a lot of them uh, relative to the size of this country. We have time for one last question if anyone wants to uh, weigh in. Sure. Um, hi, thank you for being here. Um, 
one thing that I've noticed as, as a parent of high schoolers and, and college age kids is that in small programs, like summer programs that elite institutions run for high schoolers, pre-college programs, the racial preferences seem to have become more explicit and more aggressive over the years to the point of, of just ignoring the law, you know, having racially exclusive programs, and there seems to be a feeling that somehow they can get away with it. I was wondering if you've noticed anything like that and whether that kind of ideology is actually going to obey the law if the law changes sure. on this issue. Well, I think there is going to be a tremendous pushback uh, in certain circles to the court decisions if they come down the way I assume they will. Uh, and, and by the way, I, I think the way most people assume they, they will. Um, and um, I can tell you that you know my organization, for one, is going to try to be a watchdog on that and try to push back. I mean, you know, Jason and I were talking earlier. Uh, it's not polite to say this, but uh, in 1954, when Brown v. Board of Education came down, there was a Southern strategy. They pushed back. They refused uh, to obey, um, and um, ultimately, the government got uh, involved and. Um, what needs to happen now is a recognition that if you disobey the law, um, we are a nation of laws. And uh, if you don't like the law, if you want racial preference uh, to be the law of the land, be my guest, go in to Congress, offer legislation that makes that explicit, and see if you can pass it. Uh, of course, if it's the 14th Amendment, um, that may not help. Uh, but, you know, uh, I, I think, again, it's, it's a matter of speaking out. Um, the 74% of, of Americans who oppose racial preferences uh, need to be willing to say they do and say why they do and recognize that they are not all white Americans. They are people of all colors. Um, and, and in most of the, the data that I've seen, um, it's sometimes a small majority, but usually majority of, of blacks and Latinos uh, who oppose uh, those preferences. Thank you, Linda. Thank uh, you.